What are the uses that um, they, they indicate is, is associated with the 70% that is farm, uh, farm related? Therefore, in my opinion, um, the rezoning meets the spirit and intent of the official plan and zoning bylaw. It's also worthwhile noting that one benefit of a rezoning application is that this then will kick this development into site plan control, at which time the municipality can regulate a number of matters uh, not that cannot be regulated under the zoning bylaw, and that would be include landscaping, um, finished material on the building, painting, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it can include um, where storage locations can be located, parking parking lots, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a benefit to the uh, to the rezoning that is not associated or that cannot be regulated by a building permit or uh, res um, yeah, by a building permit process. So, as I said, there's a benefit to this. But in conclusion, uh, Mr. Chair, members, in my opinion, um, the proposal meets the spirit and intent of the official plan and zoning bylaw. I can respond to questions. A member of committee, a question of our applicant, member Bell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the to the applicant. Can you put up that photograph that I just referred to, which is page 44, I think, of our package? Yeah, I've. That was, that was my photograph, so I, I, I know the photograph you're referring to. Uh, the, uh, yeah. So the, can the, air, the aerial of the. Uh, yeah. So can you then explain to me what's going on in the middle of this? Yeah, it's part, part of agricultural land that looks again just like a contracted yard. Yeah, the, the contracting yard is on the south side, south extreme of the, uh, of the lot. In the middle of the uh, property is a fairly newly constructed house and farm buildings. My understanding that there's livestock. Livestock. Uh, Mr. Corner is sitting there, so there's livestock uh, associated in that building as well. Not at all clear to me that there is a livestock building, but can our staff confirm that? Um, I can direct it to you, Ryan. Number Mr. Chair, Chair, I can confirm the use of those buildings in the center of the property. I cannot confirm what the use of those buildings are at this time. I haven't inspected them myself. Member Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chief, through you to Robert. Um, just to be clear, the uh, Middleport's been operating out of this location for a while. Um, well, Middle, Middleport Mechanical used to be located to the west. Um, their lease in, in a commercial plaza, uh, their lease was not extended. Um, so they moved their their operation into a building that uh, they recently got a building permit for, and the building permit was for a farm storage building. That's what the building permit was issued for. Uh, during the final inspection by the building department, it was noted that, it, in fact, a business was being conducted in there, and that's why we're here today. And your um, your clients willing to work with planning staff to address some of the neighbors concerns through site plan? Absolutely. Thank you. Member Farrier. Um, just wanted to ask the applicant, uh, the agent of the applicant, um, is middleportmech.com the website for this organization? I have to. Hey, I'm, I just did a brief um, scan of the website. Um, made in 2016, Middleport Mechanical Heating and Cooling. It says residential, commercial, indoor comfort, house, home, several times. It never once mentions farm or agriculture or anything like that. And it's, it's actually a pretty depth-filled website with lots of different uh, things. If 70% of their business is related to the agricultural community, they sure don't market towards it. Is there any way we can have some confirmation of that 70% number, please? Uh. Well, I, I, guess, I guess I would be looking at his business plan, uh, Mr. Corner's business plan, and uh, I don't know whether the municipality has a right to look at his books or not. So, well, I, I know I, I asked I, if we I, could. I mean, I had a look at the same website, and, and uh, you know, I, I understand what you're saying. Any other member of the committee with a question? Agent of our applicant? Member Gatward? Uh, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm not sure if Mr. Van Porten would know the answer to this question. We did receive correspondence today about this site. And are you aware of the trailer that's parked on that site? I've not, I've not seen that correspondence. Oh. Okay, then you won't be able to answer my question. It was, it was um, said in an email uh, that someone was living in that trailer. So you can't confirm that? No. Can the applicant, is he here? He is here. I cannot allow you to speak from there, sir. If you want to speak, you need to come to the podium with your agent, if you choose to. So I'm the question down was, oh, is there sorry. anyone living in a trailer that's parked on your property? There is not, no. Thank you. There is not, no. Yeah, bylaw came out, and... We didn't realize there was a bylaw for it uh, last week, so the trailer's been removed. Does that answer your question, yes. Member Gatworth? Okay, thank you. Yes. Any other member of the committee with a question of the applicant? Member Bailey? Did he say the trailer was removed? Yes. yes sir. When was it removed? Uh, thank you. Please, sir, if you're going to talk, stay at the podium. I cannot allow you to talk from there. That's the like bylaw officer attended, uh, I believe, uh, probably a week ago on the Monday, gave us to the Friday, and it was removed by the Friday. And the bylaw officer did come out and double check on that. Right. What year did you build that building? It was built in last year, so it would have been 2018. So you've been in there for just over a year? No, it was built in 2018. I've been in there about eight months. Thank you. Maybe a little longer. Any other member of the committee with a question of our applicant? Seeing none, thank you. thank you. Turn this portion of the application over to the public. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this application? Aye. Please come forward and state your name and address. Uh, yes, my name is Byron Souls. Um, I live at 12 Hager Street, uh, Middleport. And uh, I am basically directly behind on the south side of Mr. Corner's property. Um, it has caused myself and my delegates and the people of Middleport uh, much hardship, uh, not only to the uh, areas that I outlined in the delegation paper, um, but financially too as well as far as our property values go. Um, Mr. Corner has been running this business for two years out of uh, this uh, location. He actually ran another business down the road, five years, Middleport Plaza, and he exclusively um, sold uh, fireplaces, residential, uh, commercial, um, so this whole uh, farmland thing, or farm and uh, work thing, I don't, I don't understand. Um, it's my concern that the zoning be stopped. If Mr. Corner does get this zoning, um, we do believe that he will do whatever he pleases. Um, we've been putting up with this for two years. The traffic has slowly gotten worse too as well. Um, our privacy has been invaded, and we've had enough. The last straw was Mr. Corner and uh, his trailer, which people were living in. And uh, we've had enough. Um, and I'm here tonight to stop the rezoning. And, um, and I think that nothing was said when the building was built, because in Middleport, we all want to be good neighbors. Everybody wants to be a good neighbor. And unfortunately, um, this has gone on too long, and um, the consequences um, could be grave if this goes through. Um, so, um, we want it stopped, and we're not going to uh, we're not going to take it anymore. Um, Mr. Corner is a bad neighbor. 
unfortunately, I have to say that, but he is. He does not care about the people in the village, and he definitely doesn't care about any of my delegates. So, um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there any other member, people making presentations on Mark? We don't cross them. Any other member of the public would like to speak to this application? Please come forward. I've got you a second, sir. Sir, I've got this gentleman here, and then you, but you can come up and stand. Sir, you can come up and stand in line. I would prefer to speak to the application and not have negative comments about the applicant, please. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Uh, name and address? Uh, Mike Reisiger, 1184, Highway 54. I own the farm to the east of Mr. Corner's property. Uh, I just had a couple of comments. Um, just to clarify, there was something said about settlement zone. I just wanted to clarify with the planner that this ag zone is directly adjacent to residential. Can I clarify that? or? It's directly adjacent to a residential zone. Well, there's lots of uh, zoning that are adjacent to a different zone. Right? But the question was, it was there was a, something, is this adjacent to a settlement zone, settlement boundary, or is this property adjacent to a residential? Because that's, that's what's in the zoning bylaw. There are numerous uh, um, places where they directly talk about exceptions to rules when a property is adjacent to a residential zone. And that speaks to uh, something that the delegate for, or the representative from Cahoon said that because his setback issues are all directly addressed in the zoning bylaw directly, there's no SBA required. They're all contraventions of the zoning bylaw. So I just want to clarify that this property is directly adjacent to a residential zone. That's fine, you can make your presentation. Okay, uh, that's the question. I don't know why you can't just answer the question. Is the property, is the ag zone directly adjacent to the VR zone? Do you have an answer for that? I, we, can, we can research that for you. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, if I may. That's a warning. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for clarification purposes. Uh, the question that was posed previous by Councillor Gatwood was with respect to the location of the Location of the proposed rezoning is if it's within a, a settlement area as defined in the official plan, and that was uh, pointed out here. Um, this is, uh, is the black line is the settlement area within the official plan, um, and I just wanted to recognize that it is in fact the, the subject lands are adjacent to um, the VR zone, but that's that's within the zoning bylaw. The, the reference made earlier was within with respect to the the schedule in the official plan. Uh, so that might be the, the distinction that had to be made there. Continue. Okay. Um, you, I think in the beginning of your presentation, you said the purpose of the official plan recognizing an agricultural zone is to protect agricultural land from being developed, to protect it from being, and maintain it in, as an agricultural use. Uh, so my question would be, why is this a zoning amendment as opposed to an official plan amendment? That is a, an answer to that question. will be dealt with in the future. Please make your presentation. Okay. Um, the 70% the number, um, I would expect that would be an audited number. Continue. Okay, that's the end of my comment. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Next, sir. Good evening. Uh, I'm Derek Kuypers. Um, I live at 16 Middleport Road, which is uh, the abutting residential lot directly to the uh, south of uh, 4 Middleport Road, which is owned by John Corner. 
Um, I've lived at this property for my entire life, uh, and I purchased the property about two and a half years ago from my father. Um, at this time, uh, the lot, um, when I bought it, everything behind it was agricultural fields. There was no buildings there, and this is what I assumed it would be used for as it was listed as agricultural property. Um, so shortly after purchasing it, um, this building uh, began going up in directly to the north of it. Um, the building's approximately 15 meters away from my property line. It's a rather large building. Um, I did not see any postings or letters or anything that the building was going to be placed there. Um, so my concerns with the property being there, um, there are a few. Um, in no particular order is lighting. There is bright LED lights around the entire perimeter of this building that are on all night, seven days a week, and uh, they shine directly into my bedroom. Um, we've had to buy curtains and uh, to stop this from shining into my um, into my room. Um, also lights up my backyard at all times of the night. Um, as far as noise is concerned, as early as six o'clock in the morning, I'm hearing trucks going in and out of this property and uh, emptying dumpsters, backup beepers, the whole bit. It's uh, woke me up many times and uh, it's causing me uh, a lot of distress. Um, being it as my uh, first property I purchased, um, property value is something that I am concerned with of course and having a property backing onto agricultural fields obviously would be a lot nicer than um, a view of a giant construction yard or building which is now only thing I can see of my backyard now. Um, also, drainage, shortly after the building and construction started, I noticed, excuse me, that there is water pooling up in my backyard and I'm also getting water draining into my finished basement now, which was never there before um, that, I can, uh, that I've noticed. Um, increased traffic on the road now too is uh, getting to the point that it is a little bit of a hazard now. I can no longer walk down this quiet road, which it used to be before walking my dogs, bike riding, such as stuff like that. Um, loss of privacy. I've got vehicles coming in and out at all times of the day, um, in and out of there, and uh, there's cameras installed on the building, and my entire backyard, I don't feel, has any privacy whatsoever anymore since this business has been operated out of there. So it's caused a lot of loss of enjoyment for me, um, having, it th having it that way now, so... Um, as far as it being uh, agricultural use in the building there, there is a giant showroom in the front of it filled with fireplaces and barbecues, and it does not seem like it's catered at all towards uh, agricultural use. It seems like it's a commercial business and it's being uh, used as such. So I think that's uh, all I have to say. Thank you. Any other member of the public would like to comment on this application? I'll ask a second time. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this application? Please come forward, ma'am. State your name and address. My name is Catherine Reisiger. I live at 1184 Highway 54. We are the farm adjacent to subject land. In some of the correspondence that has uh, come back and forth between the County of Brant and ourselves, uh, one of the questions that came out of it was, if the application is not approved by Council, what happens next? Please stay there. You'll, you'll get an answer to that um, from staff in writing. You said you had indicated you had had some correspondence with staff. Mm -hmm. Was that question asked of staff? Didn't no, you uh, no we, we asked. The, it, the response was left open. So that's why I want to know what would happen next. Well, that will be up to the owner of the property to determine what he would want to do with it if this application is denied. Any other member of the public would like to speak to this application? Please come forward, state your name and address. Patricia Collins, 
I live at 1176 Highway 54. And we're here because we just don't understand why with 55 acres, the man had to pick a, a spot that was in everybody's backyard. It's as simple as that. There's lots of other questions, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Any other member of the public would like to speak to this application? I'll ask a third and final time. Is there any other member of the public would like to speak to this application? Seeing no one else, I'll close this portion of the application and turn it back to the committee. How would you like to deal with it? Member Coleman? Seeking a seconder? Seconded by Member Miller. Member Chambers? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the motion is to receive, and, and this uh, will be presented again for a recommendation at the next meeting, which would be in September. Is that correct? Um, it could be at September. It might not be till October. Uh, I've, I've seen applications take close to a year before it comes back. So as, as early as September, but not yeah. in August because there is no meeting. I'm just wondering if some of the questions that were asked by the, uh, the, 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 the public uh, that may not have gotten an answer. Could, could those answers uh, be provided uh, uh, in time for our next meeting? Yes, they will be. Thanks. Member Gatward? Well, my question was along the same line, Mr. Chairman. I wondered, since Mr. Amporton and the applicant are here tonight and the residents have asked questions, and there's questions in the correspondence as well, can they not answer it this evening? or? If they're, if they're prepared to, yes. If they're not prepared to, they may have to research the question to come up with a suitable answer mm -hmm. for you, Member Galward. Yes. Many times we do have them come back after. Yeah, many Thank times you. we do and many times we don't. Member Thank you. Member to, to be fair, I, I checked the dates of the emails. They were yesterday or today. So, and a lot of the questions are very complex, so I don't expect an answer to be ready. However, when the answers are given, can Council also receive a report with those the questions asked by the residents and the answers from staff so we can make the most educated decision possible? The answer to that question is yes. Thank you. Member Bailey? Well, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> some of the questions that were asked here were very simple questions, and we have a room full of staff, and you're not, you didn't even ask staff whether they could answer them here tonight. You didn't refer to staff, and the people are here tonight. The, the questions are very clear. This isn't the first time something like this has happened. So there is, they should be given an answer as to if the zoning doesn't go through, what happens to this man who's running a business in an area that he's not supposed to be running a business in? It's a simple question. Staff should be asked what the answer is. And I answered that question, sir, by saying that the onus will be on the owner of the property if this application does not go through, how he should proceed. Mr. Chair, I'd like you to ask staff Right now, they're here. What happens to someone who's running a business illegally if the zoning is turned down? Brian, would you like to answer that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with respect to that question, the building was built under the pretense and understanding that it's an agricultural building within the agricultural zone. Um, and so the owner applicant would be afforded the opportunity at the very least to maintain that building for that intended purpose. Um, noting that, the knowledge that we have that there is currently an illegal business being run out of that building, um, I, I would be uh, I would be certain that our, our bylaw enforcement folks would be out there to ensure that that business is discontinued. Um, and if it is the 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 uh, at the impetus of the the applicant to move the building uh, to a more suitable suitable location, um, or at the very least, again, cease the operation of that business uh, on site. Um, and again, our bylaw folks would be the ones that would be enforcing that. Um, because at this time it would be out of the hands of the planning division noted that the application in theory would be turned down. Member Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to you, I think to the staff, um, I've heard the word three times now, pretense. Uh, that sort of says to me that we're being, trying, we're being asked to approve something which is actually not real. It, it's a, a fake. We're actually being asked to zone from agricultural to agricultural E, when in fact we should be re rezoning or considering rezoning from agricultural to probably commercial. So I think I can't even support receiving this application in the form that it is now, 
I think it ought to be redrafted and resubmitted. Rob, you want to comment? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, not to uh, Councillor Bell's comment, but to the, ca the comment raised by um, Mayor Bailey. Um, with respect to uh, a decision of, of Council, should it ultimately get there to refuse this application, um, the applicant would, of course, have the opportunity to appeal to the Local Planning Appeals Tribunal, and he would have to make his case at that tribunal uh, with respect to um, uh, the decision if it were turned down. Um, likewise, if, um, or rather, on the opposite side, um, were Council to approve this application, um, any abutting neighbours or uh, people who had an interest in the application, they could also appeal to the Local Planning Appeals Tribunal. And then there would be a hearing and we would get uh, instructions from Council through our solicitor to, as to what our position would be and then we would carry on through that process. Clear it up for you? Well, thank you. I think they deserve answers. They've gone to a lot of trouble to gather and they asked a simple question and you didn't ask for the answer. So I think that was wrong of the chair, and I think it was wrong for maybe even a hand to go up for staff to recommend an answer to these people. So I guess it's cleared up. Good. Thank you, Rob. We've got a mover and a seconder to receive his information. I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? All the vote again. All those in favor to receive his information. Put your hand clearly up. Opposed. It is carried to receive his information. Now what will happen? Staff will come back at a further meeting with a recommendation either to approve the application or to deny the application. Is there any further question from committee? Seeing none, we'll move on to C. And the applicant is not here, so we're... Yeah, we're going to go to D, right? Are they here? I Because I have not seen them arrive. I don't see them either. So we'll... Rob, I'm going to move on to public hearings under the Planning Act to... Deal with recommendations. And is all of that here? Okay. I, kn I know you had that application. But yeah, okay. I'm Just hang on. on. Going to move on to public hearings under the Planning Act to consider staff recommendations. First one is a bylaw housekeeping amendment, ZBA 18 19 mm -hmm. JK, and I'll ask John. Uh, item D is uh, an information meeting. C is not here. We did D. C. <coughs> and B. Sorry. Rob, I'm sorry. D. Lady, Lady Shady Acres, West Quarter Town Line Road, ZBA 16-19-RT, which is Rob Trump. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I don't think it was a show of force here with uh, Mr. Hitchon and myself both at the podium, but uh, <laughs> we, will, uh, we will get our way through this. Um, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, um, uh, this information meeting is, uh, uh, is an application for a zoning bylaw amendment uh, regarding 296 West Court of Town Line Road. Um, this is affectionately referred to as Lion Shady Acres. Uh, it's a trailer park. Tonight's uh, public meeting is uh, for information purposes only. There will be no decisions made with respect to this application tonight. A um, bit of a poor map, but the lighting kind of washes it out, but uh, the address is 296 West Port of Town Line Road. It's on the east side of the road um, between the, the 8th and 9th uh, concession roads. This is a better uh, illustration of the existing park. Uh, the area of the, of the property is approximately uh, 70 acres, but the actual area of where the trailers are located is approximately 9 acres. Um, it's got a frontage of uh, 600 meters on, on West Quarter Town Line, and the depth varies from 300 to 600. It's a bit of an irregular shaped property. Um, in our official plan, it, there's a site-specific policy that pertains to these, uh, to these lands, uh, SSPA number 9, um, and it, uh, it allows for seasonal tourist trailers or campers plus one permanent dwelling. So that's what's currently in our official plan. In the zoning bylaw, uh, there's also a site specific. It's zoned OS32, 
with uh, natural heritage and agricultural zones. <coughs> and the, you can see on the sketch the OS32 um, portions. The green portion that kind of bisects the property is a natural heritage or open space zone. Um, and then surrounding it are some agricultural zones as well. Um, the site specific allows for 85 trailer sites. Um, they're occupied, they can be occupied between March uh, 1st and January 31st, but they must be unoccupied uh, from February 1st to the end of February each year. That's what's currently in the zoning bylaw. Uh, it also allows for one dwelling unit that may be occupied year round, so for a caretaker or the existing owner, if you will. The proposal that's before uh, council or for committee um, is a zoning bylaw amendment to rezone the subject lands to allow for a year round occupancy of mobile homes for a period of three years as a temporary use, whereas the bylaw provides for occupancy of residential trailers for only 11 months of the year. So 11 months to year round. <laughs> the key issues, um, and this is really where the, um, where the meat of this application lies, um, the key issues pertaining to this application pertain to um, provincial policy um, pertaining to settlement areas. Um, the establishment of a year-round trailer park, um, we've, the latest information we have from the province uh, is they feel that it's uh, a settlement area and new settlement areas are prohibited. So we need to get the provincial position on this and we need to speak to them. We have been speaking to them. Um, our research with other municipalities uh, indicates that most municipalities tend to turn a blind eye to year-round uh, occupancy. Um, but the, the provincial position is going to be important on this. Um, the good news is that recently the province held a webinar um, on the issue of tiny homes. And that webinar, uh, a portion of that webinar was focused on affordable housing. Um, I know that these, these types of dwellings are seen as a potential affordable housing um, opportunity, so there might be some traction with the province on that. Um, and we also need comments from the province uh, with respect to the uh, septic facility uh, going turning year round um, that's that's one of the things we also need some some comment on um, from a legal perspective obviously the the county has to be concerned about the health and safety of residents um, not all trailer parks um, but many trailer parks are not designed to be um, inhabited year round um, and from a from a, a, a legal and um, enforcement perspective uh, our building department has has tremendous issue with uh, the issuance of building permits for permanent occupancy because because they're not supposed to be permanent. So we, we've got, we're into this kind of uh, trap where we can't issue the permits that need to get issued to make them safe. So these are some of the things that we're having to deal with. Um, so for this application, um, we're expecting comments to be coming in from the internal and external agencies, including the province. Um, and then we'll get, uh, we'll, uh, there'll be further review and discussion with the applicant um, and the agent and staff. Uh, we'll have a formal public meeting as, as required under the Act, and then we'll come back to the committee with, uh, with a recommendation report. We're hoping to do it fairly quickly, if we can, um, because we know September, October, November brings colder weather, and we'd like to get some, some direction on this fairly quickly. Um, and with that, um, I believe, Mr. Chairman, that those, that concludes my comments. Uh, I'll answer any questions. I do note that um, the, the agent, uh, Mr. Hitchon, is here, and. I'm sure he will present as well. Thank you. Member Hobbs. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Mr. Trotter. Um, so just thinking a couple steps ahead here to if, if we move to receive this and if down the road it ends up being approved, what happens in three years? Um, the temporary use would expire in three years and they could come back and renew it. Um, alternatively, um, there, there could be changes to policy that allow for these things to become permanent. Um, that's certainly something that we'll be looking at through our official plan review that we're gonna be commencing. And, um, and we may get some decision out of the province with respect to kind of a tiny home affordable housing component that might give us a little bit of leeway to, to, to deal with these things. Mr. Bailey? Well, I certainly support the three year uh, bylaw just to keep things moving. I mean, depending on uh, Ministry for any kind of decision or direction. I mean, it changes by the hour. Um, I think three years will give us uh, lots of time to do this properly. But at least, I mean, we're playing games with ourselves. I mean, 
Okay, to ask these people to leave for one month is ridiculous. Nothing changes in the world. Nothing changes in our lives or their lives. And, I mean, the three years would at least give us time to investigate and go to the ministry and figure out whether it is small homes or whether it is a trailer park or what it is. And I just think that, um, I think to make it happen quickly, as you said, uh, we should we should accept this three-year uh, term so that we have three years to do it right and to go after it properly. Because I said we're, we're playing games with ourselves. We know that nothing changes because they have to move out. And you know, I, I think it's I think it's very important to recognize that these people are not 21 years old. They have medical conditions. They have pets. And we I guess chose February because it's the shortest month of the year because we're kind, which is ridiculous. Um, I'm not sure why we decided to, to let them move out in the middle of winter. It's absolutely ridiculous. The whole thing, you can't even say it out loud without being embarrassed. So I'm asking people to support the three-year trial, and then we'll come back after we have time to figure it out. Thank you. Member Pierce? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Mr. Trotter. Um, so with what's going on with, with, with this one here, as, as we all know, there's other trailer parks in the county. Um, is this going to open the door for across the board, or um, have you had any other requests? Where is this going to go from there? Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, we have we have not had any other requests um, in the form of applications at this time. As you know, we've had many discussions with other trailer park uh, owners. Um, some of them have been in front of this committee and given presentations. Um, at this point, uh, we don't have direction from council to do anything with respect to that. Um, but I would. Um, welcome that. So this is specific for this This is specific one. to this parcel. It is a specific application made by the by the applicant on, on only this parcel. Correct. Perfect. Thank you. Member Fair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Rob. Um, in your presentation, there was a slide there that talked about how other municipalities just generally turn a blind eye. And I, my understanding is that was essentially the position the county had taken previous to more recently. Um, I, I would rather not comment on that, Mr. Chairman. That's fine. Um, but, but in that research, you plead the fifth, I don't know if that's the, this country, but okay. Um, but with that, in doing the research and finding that out about other municipalities, I know our mayor and I know some other elected folks around this table have spoken with um, provincial folks and ministries about this specific issue and this specific site. Mm -hmm. Might there be an opportunity, if you know the other municipalities that have turned a blind eye, to get some of them on board as well to present to the province about the timeliness of this and how it might fold into the case, which is the name for the tiny homes, the case housing um, legislation. So we can make a big impact. Yeah, yeah, through you, Mr. Chairman, that's that's always a possibility that other municipalities would jump on board. You'll note that I didn't list them by name, so it's uh, uh, and most of that work was done over the phone. Um, but it's, uh, it, it is an issue that I think everyone knows is out there, and I, I think we would like to get some resolution to it. Um, I, I should uh, be. I should advise the committee that, um, due to the provincial policies that pertain to um, the, the planning and the, and the planning nature of this type of application, our hands might be tied from a commenting point of view with mm -hmm. respect to this. Um, I'm just letting you know that ahead of time, um, because they, our our uh, our decisions have to be in, in line with the provincial policy. So. And I just want to say thank you for a thorough, fair, and uh, um, good presentation on a very complex subject, from especially from your point of view. So thank you. We're just getting started. Member Miller? Actually, uh, Councilor Fair had the same question I did about turning a blind eye. So, uh, Rob, I, I appreciate the, <laughs> the no answer to that one. Um, but I just want to say I don't know where how this amendment is going to turn out. And if it's successful, uh, where we're going to be in three years. But I do appreciate you bringing this forward because I know it's a messy situation, but I'd rather deal with it this way than not. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Member Chambers. Uh, Mr. Chairman, through you to uh, Rob, uh, you prefaced your comments before you started by saying that uh, this meeting tonight is to receive information only and no decision will be made. So I'm assuming no deliberations about the issue are to be made tonight. It's just to receive information. I'm just clarifying this. To receive information, and a, a subsequent meeting will be held 
where we can deliberate the issue at length. Is that correct? That's correct. So once again, just to be clear, the, the meeting tonight is just to receive information. No deliberation will be taking place. Correct. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you. Any further questions for our planner? Seeing none, thank you. I'll ask the applicant or an agent of the applicant to come forward and make his presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Hitchon Nichols, JA, uh, 20 Wellington Street, Brantford. I'm appearing uh, this evening on behalf of the owner of the park, which uh, is the Corporation Lions uh, the Line Inc. And Mr. Uh, Jeff Lyons Mounds uh, is the owner of that and has uh, several uh, facilities of a, of a similar nature. Uh, with me tonight is uh, Pam Pubic. Um, in the front row, who is uh, park administrator for this park and others. And also Mike Kempinski, who is the um, park manager. And Mr. Chairman, uh, in uh, the gallery are numerous residents and supporters of the residents. And perhaps in lieu of asking them all to speak, I would ask if they could stand, sir. Thank you. So my, my question then to you, Mr. Hitchon, is are you going to be speaking for them as a group or may some of them come up individually? I'm speaking just on behalf of the owner if they wish to speak. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. That they, they certainly uh, have that, that privilege. Uh, mm -hmm. They will also have that opportunity at the, uh, at the next meeting as well. <clears throat> but they are here, uh, as indicated, in, in support of this application. The... Um, Planner has outlined the existing official plan and the existing zoning provisions, allowing for 85 uh, trailer sites. Uh, in fact, 47 are occupied, and there's some 67 uh, res residents. The residents have uh, been there for years and years. I have uh, from my client, I believe you have as well, um, in writing that he bought the property and with the trailers on it some 17 years ago. Uh, there were people who lived there year-round at that time. Uh, you know that this past year, the um, bylaw enforcement uh, gave notice to the residents that they had to clear out in, in February. That caused a, a lot of stress and concern on their part, and they came to see you in December. And at that time, there were numerous letters that outlined why it was uh, so stressful um, for them uh, to receive those notices and the thought and prospect uh, of having to move out of their homes. Um, also, there's, so that prospect still exists. So we, we talked with staff um, and, and determined uh, the best way for us to proceed was to buy this three years time by a temporary zoning bylaw. I suspect staff still doesn't like it and still may be bound by their planning principles to say it's not in conformity with the growth plan. Uh, you may hear that when we come back to the hearing, but I, I say to you that it is up to you whether or not you pass that temporary zoning bylaw. And yes, the province may be watching. Well, let the province appeal it. Let's let these people stay in their homes at least for three years while we work with the municipality and potentially other municipalities to attempt to resolve the issues so that all the safety concerns are, are addressed. Um, we have spoken with a planner in the person of Ruth Victor, um, and we will uh, have her meeting with staff uh, in the interim to try to find a way to uh, move the matter forward, both locally and provincially. And, and so you've heard that there are discussions uh, going on about this. We hope that the province will indeed play a role in resolving the issue and, and that it's, standards can be set that can be met to ensure uh, the, the safety uh, and comfort of the residents. Uh, I think all of those who are here tonight would tell you that they have no fears about their safety. Um, 
uh, and none about their comfort as well. They would have more if they had to move out during the month of February. What happens to their premises? What happens with vandals? What are the police going to be around? Is our pipes going to freeze? Are things going to go on like that? And, and so it's, uh, they, they would have more concerns if they had, in fact, to abide by that. Uh, it is um, a seniors community. It is, um, in many respects, affordable. And we urge you to grant them and us the time uh, to work with you to try to solve this problem. I would point out that when my client purchased the property, and he has stated this to the county in writing before, um, that they did put in a new septic system. They did pave the roads. They do have a water system that is monitored every day for, for um, its uh, purity, quality, and, and meeting provincial standards. So this is, and I'm, I'm sure many of you have been out there, you can tell it's a well-loved, uh, a well-constructed community, and uh, they wish to be able to keep that lifestyle, and we hope you can assist them in doing that. Thank you very much. I'll be pleased to answer any questions. And uh, we also have the staff from the um, owner here as well, too, if there's some technical questions. Thank you. A member of the committee with a question of the applicant, Member Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through you, uh, Jay, I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around the, this three-year temporary use uh, stipulation. I, is that uh, a, a meeting of the minds of the applicant and, and staff, or is that something that, that you feel is... is uh, uh, it's, a, it's a mechanism that buys us time. I would, I would not say that staff has accepted that, no. I would hope that we can eventually convince them to do that before the next meeting, but at this point in time, we have not. Any other member of committee with a question of the agent's applicant? Applicant's agent? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, members. I'll open this portion of the meeting to the public. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this application? Please come forward, ma'am. State your name and address. Yes, I, I kind of shrink behind the podium <laughs> and that, but my name is Janice Gumbly, and I live at 296 West Quarter Town Line Road, thank you, <laughs> in Unit 65. I've been living there for four years now, and I was so pleased to find this park. And... I think it's a shame that that program called the Trailer Park Boys, it really, really put a stigmatism on our community. Because you mentioned that you live in a trailer park and people go, what, a trailer park? Oh, you. It's not like that at all. And members of council who have come out to have a look at it We'll see. It's a beautiful community, beautiful mature trees. The residents all support and are concerned about each other. It is a safe place to live. Let me tell you, I, well, maybe I shouldn't say it too loud. I leave my doors unlocked. And there's a few nights I've accidentally left my door unlocked. Not, but nobody's ever come in. Nobody's taken anything out of my house and not. So rather than looking at it as a trailer park, I would like council to change their mindset and think of it as an alternative way of living, Alter alternative accommodations. Yeah, I didn't want to go live in, in, in an apartment. Yuck. I'm a country girl, and I enjoy the outdoors, I enjoy the trees, I enjoy the birds there, 
and the other wildlife that comes to visit in the morning and not. What, so I really want you to look at it differently because I'll tell you a little bit of my, my story. I've been a single mom for over 30 years. I worked in a nonprofit agency providing services to seniors, such as Meals on Wheels, transportation, uh, foot care clinics, exercise program, and that in Hamilton. There was, I loved my job. I loved working with people, helping them. I've always been a helper. That's the kind of jobs I've always had. But single mom with a derelict dad, or whatever you want to call him. <laughs> Anyways, he wasn't very supportive of his kids. There was no pension. And as you know, women aren't paid as well as men. I put away as much as I could. I've helped my children out with school. I've helped my son, yes, buy his first home because he was making minimum wage and not. But I don't have a pension to turn to. I only have my savings. And unfortunately, 14, 15 years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer. That's why I have this disability. So when I found the park and found a place I could buy that was affordable, and if you looked at the houses out there now, do you think I can go if, if this isn't approved? Do you think any of us can go and purchase a house at the rates they're at these days? Forget it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a senior citizen. On, I'm not even 65 yet. I had, to, I had to quit my career when I was 58 because of, because of the cancer. It breaks my bones. It's made a hump in my back. I had to stop because I just couldn't do any more. And not. And I had to find some, and I had to give up my home in Caledonia and find something that was affordable. This was affordable. It's affordable rent, the cost of the my tiny house or small house was affordable. My house is all winterized. It's perfect year round. We have, I happen to have a standby generator. Yeah, I put up the, bu the box to get a standby generator so that I would be looked after through the winter should the hydro go out. And I know there's a number of other people in the park that have done the same thing. We're there because it's affordable for all of us. Because we're all in the same boat. I'm sure the others will, can put up their hand and say, yeah, I'm in the same boat too. I, I, if we're asked to move out, there's nowhere else for us to go except on welfare. And maybe, maybe we could afford a tent and put it in the local park. There's a nice park down the road. I'm sure you don't want to see that. But I, I ask the council to please, please take all of this into consideration. That our, we, we aren't a trailer park. This is a community of buildings that are smaller, that are well taken care of, that are looked after. And it is a community of people who started not knowing each other, but we do now. And listen, we're there to help each other when we need it. We really are, and not. So I thank you for listening to me. And Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Is there any other member would like to comment on this application? Looks like maybe you spoke for them all, ma'am. 
I'll ask a second time. Is there any other member of the audience who would like to speak to this application? I'll ask a third and final time. Is there any other member who would like to speak to this application? Please come forward, state your name and address. My name is Bonnie Pello, and I live at 296 West Porter Town, Lot 84. I've lived there for 21 years. That's all I have to say. Any other member of the public would like to speak to this application? This is the third and final time. Is there any other member of the public would like to speak to this application? Seeing no one, I'm going to turn it back to the committee. How does the committee wish to deal with the application? Member Coleman, receive his information, seconded by Member Bell. Any further questions or comments? Member Miller? Go back to um, the fact that. Uh, Planning's brought this before us, and, and, and it's not, I appreciate, and we're not deliberating, but I do appreciate it, it's a complex issue. <laughs> that I'll, I'll leave it at that, because I know we have to protect our agricultural land, but there's been, as Bonnie pointed out, she's been there for 21 years, so um, it's just a very, very complex situation, so that's all. Thank you. Any other member of the committee with a comment before I call the vote to receive? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? Is carried. And this will come back at a future meeting with a staff recommendation either to approve or deny. I thank you, Mr. Hachan. You know how this works. So I'll refer back, I apologize for getting out of order, to see if the applicant, Mr. Birdsell and Ms. Pierce, are here because they haven't been here at the start of the meeting. What's, what's going to happen, ma'am? We're not going to deal with it at this point in time. The applicant is here, but their agent isn't. So if Mr. Snodgrass arrives with permission of the committee, after we deal with the public hearings under the Planning Act to deal with recommendations, I will ask the committee to bring, to bring it back. If the committee agrees to, we'll do that at the end of the next section. It could take 15 minutes, and it could take two hours. That's all I can tell you. But the, the applicant's agent is not here. He's uh, no, she can't. Yeah, I'm, I understand that. that yep, yep. Um, well, I, I understand that, but I, but I. I acknowledge, it. I acknowledge that, but I'm going to try and move the meeting along. We've got applications. Other people are here, too. 
and uh, going to try and move the meeting along to deal with our staff recommendations. And if their agent comes, he has a presentation, and that's only fair. If he's at the city city hall right now, because they're planning meetings at the same time as ours. Mr. Chair, point of order, if I could, can, uh, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm not sure if you said it earlier, but there is the, the ledger at the back of the room they can sign to show that they were here? Yeah. At the, there's at the back the, of the, room, the back. piece of paper? When you come through the door on the right-hand yeah. side, if you'd like any Sorry, further information, leave your name and address there. So we'll move along under public hearings under the Planning Act to deal with staff recommendations, and I'll ask our site plan controller, Ms. Kitchen, to come forward. We have a zoning bylaw housekeeping amendment to deal with first. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. Staff have undertaken a fourth housekeeping bylaw amendment to the County of Brant Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw 61-16. This evening, staff is recommending approval of all changes that have been made. This concludes my comments. Thank you. Any member of the committee with a question of the zoning bylaw? Seeing none. Member Chambers? Yes, so through you, Mr. Chairman, a, a lot of these uh, uh, housekeeping amendments are dealing with the uh, uh, cannabis uh, uh, zoning stipulations, and there are several of them that uh, uh, I may not necessarily agree with, and it's hard to go through the whole thing picking and choosing, but so I'm just going to make a couple comments. Uh, first of all, there's been a lot of uh, consternation about cannabis uh, operations in the, in the county, and uh, basically a lot of these have begun without a regulatory framework zoning-wise in place, and this is what the, uh, the, the thrust of the housekeeping amendments are. It's a little bit more than word changing, et cetera. Having said that, in general terms, uh, setbacks uh, of uh, cannabis facilities from residential areas. You're suggesting, I believe, in there 100 and, what is it, 150 yards or 150 meters, I guess it is. And in my mind, that may not be sufficient because we've had some issues with regarding odors and lighting, et cetera. And I'm wondering why uh, you're suggesting uh, 150 meters and not say 350 meters, uh, another uh, echelon of, of protection from residents from these, in, in some ways, obnoxious uses. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Chambers. So the amendments uh, included within the housekeeping bylaw to deal with cannabis are actually just changes in regards to the wording with respects to the ministry and how they've basically shifted from talking about it as medical marijuana versus cannabis. So our stipulations within the bylaw, in fact, are not changing except for the wording of cannabis, so the switching of medical marijuana to cannabis. And then, of course, yes, the change from 70 meters to 150 meters for a setback. The complaints that have been received are with respects to um, cannabis uses that are looked after under what's called a register certificate. The bylaw doesn't actually deal with those. Uh, the bylaw only deals with the licensed facilities that are more or less industrial, commercial type facilities under the bylaw. The only other um, provision under the bylaw currently within the County of Brant is the outdoor growing of cannabis, which is only permitted in the agricultural zone. And that's actually after having an opinion from OMAFRA that a crop is a crop. Just if, if I could, Mr. Chairman, to get my head around this again. For example, if someone wishes to transform his greenhouses into a, a cannabis a growing operation, and as some people have, 
uh, and you're saying that uh, these uh, zoning amendment changes have nothing to do with regulatory uh, framework on those uh, applications or those uh, uh, operations? Through you, Mr. Chair. In some instances, that's correct, because they operate under what's called a register certificate versus operating under a commercial license from the ministry. There are two separate avenues that they can obtain licenses, and what we regulate in the County of Brant is a licensed facility, not a register certificate. That is not encouraged within our bylaw, and through the actual licensing of the more industrial facilities that are our cannabis production facilities within the county, we put them through site plan control. They are regulated. They are licensed by the ministry. And those particular facilities typically have scrubbers and, and things like that to contain odor. And we actually have a few in the county that I'm unaware of having any complaints received upon. The complaints received upon are could be from other types of licensed users. So, so if I'm understanding it, then the use amendments that you're proposing, the housekeeping amendments, really do not uh, regulate issues that have been brought forward, such as the one in Princeton or, or some of these other ones around. It, it, it just, it, Through you, it, Mr. It, it, it's complicated because I know there, there are going to be uh, additional operations forthcoming that will be uh, whether they be regulated this way or that way with license or not, it, it, people will be coming to the municipality uh, with complaints about the operation in terms of lighting, in terms of commotion, in terms of odors, etc. So if you're telling me that these amendments have nothing to do with what perhaps may be coming, then I can live with it. But if we are opening the door uh, or not closing the door to these kinds of, of complaints and operations, then I, I think we need to spend a little bit more time rather than housekeeping uh, amendments. For example, and I'll just, uh, with your indulgence, Mr. Chairman, in, in my mind, uh, we, we regulate dog kennels. Dog kennels are not allowed in an agricultural zone because of the uh, whatever. And we could do the same thing with medical, with, with cannabis operations. We're not excluding them, we're making them, if someone wants one, they have to come and apply for it, and then we can put in uh, parameters to control obnoxious uses, site plans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I was thinking that if we pass this, we lose that opportunity, and you're, you're allowing them some of the, the amendments are new allowed uses uh, in, in areas. I guess I'm, I'm concerned about cannabis operations because we've had nothing but complaints about several of them, and I don't want to uh, pass something that basically legitimizes uh, obnoxious uses. Through you, Mr. Chair, to Councillor Chambers. So, with respect to what is specifically within this bylaw this evening that I'm addressing, it is quite just simply a change in what we're calling it in the bylaw to reflect the ministry's acts that they have since changed. The only thing that I intended to do through the housekeeping was create a more restrictive setback from the 70 to the 150. So, right now, as it stands, there is allowances for medical marijuana production facilities. There will be, even if these amendments aren't approved this evening, the only difference really is in what we're calling it in the bylaw. They are still challenged to meet that licensing requirement and they are still challenged by site plan control. And there would still potentially down the road be room for public input if committee seen fit through site plan control process. Member Bailey? Yeah, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, like Councillor Chambers said, I think it's bigger than a housekeeping um, piece. I think it's a whole bigger piece than this. Uh, who came up with the 150? How did you come up with it from the 70 to the 150? Through you, Mr. Chair, it was done through research of what other municipalities were doing currently. And are we on the lenient side of that, or are we, are we extreme by 150? 
for you, Mr. Chair, we're actually more lenient currently at the 70s, so we are proposing to tighten it up at 150. Thank you. Member Miller? Just uh, as far as the cannabis goes, um, actually, uh, through Mr. Chair, I'll congratulate Jessica because you've got your head wrapped around that cannabis issue really good. Registers, registrants who grow cannabis don't even require um, odor control measures. It's it, and those are the guys that we got to worry about. It's not the licensed ones. So I appreciate that. Our issue is not with the House bylaw amendments. It's with Health Canada. And once they change that, or hopefully they change that, uh, and then my understanding is you can bring those cannabis producers, the registrants, registrants under our bylaws. Is that a fair assessment? Through you, Mr. Chair, if the ministry does make changes in the future to either the licensees or the registrar users that could be incorporated within our municipal documents to offer more land use controls, certainly we could look at that at that time. Yeah, okay. But, we'll, yeah, we will definitely do that. Thank you. Member Gatward. Thank you. So in a nutshell, we can pass this tonight and still make revisions later as rules and regulations change. Through you, Mr. Chair, that is correct. Thank you. Any other member of the committee with a question? Seeing none, we'll open this up to the public. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this recommendation? I'll ask a second time. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this recommendation? I'll ask a third and final time. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this application? Recommendation. Seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Looks to me like it's carried. I thought you did, Mr. Cromwell. I'm sorry. Nope. Nope. Moved by Member Bailey, second by Member Laferria. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor of the recommendation? Opposed? It is carried. And we go forward to council for the final recommendation in 13 days. I'm going to back up because the application of 7C, the applicant is here. So I'm going to. Dan isn't here, but I assume Marcus is replacing Dan, so I'll ask Marcus to come forward and present. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we're dealing with uh, our, an information uh, request this evening for, for two applications, one for an official plan amendment and one for rezoning for 120 McBay Road. Uh, the lands are situated on the east side of, of McBay Road, uh, just near the intersection of Hammond. Uh, they are about 106 acres in size and irregularly shaped. Um, this has been in front of committee a number of times. Um, so, for all intents and purposes, it, it, it dealt with an, an official plan interpretation uh, as to the, the location of the uh, rural residential designation. Um, the proposal is to amend the official plan from agriculture to rural residential and to rezone the application or rezone the lands or portion of the lands from agricultural to rural residential. Uh, related to this application would also be a future consent application to facilitate the creation of a new residential lot that would have a frontage of 47 meters and a total area of 4,500 square meters. So once again, under the, the provisions of the current official plan, the lands are designated both natural heritage and, and agriculture. And the, the zoning of the property is, is again agricultural and natural heritage. Uh, in terms of supporting documents, uh, Snodgrass Consulting has provided a uh, rural residential zoning compliance and uh, the official plan interpretation request. 
they have provided uh, an MDS calculation for uh, for the existing uh, livestock uses on the adjacent parcels, and it uh, it would conform with those uh, those existing livestock operations. So again, uh, you can see under the provisions of the previous official plan, uh, the um, the old estate residential lots or designation uh, did not. Um, snap onto existing lot lines. They kind of uh, were ballooned out. And uh, when we did the new official plan, the 2012 official plan, the, the designations were then snapped to uh, match property lines at that time. So again, this, this kind of shows uh, what the current official plan was or is and the pr previous official plan was in terms of designation. With regard to policies, uh, obviously the provincial policy statement, we, uh, we look at uh, prime agricultural areas that are to be protected. Um, the creation of new residential lots in prime agricultural areas are not to be uh, permitted. Uh, the official plan speaks to, again, protection of, of prime agriculture and to restrict the creation of new residential lots. So, so next steps, uh, we'll receive uh, comments this evening. Um, get uh, uh, information from internal and external agencies, uh, prepare a, sta uh, a staff report, and uh, bring it back at a later date. That concludes my comments. Any member of committee with a question of our planner? Seeing none, is the applicant or an agent of the applicant here would like to make a presentation. Please come forward and state your name and address. Chairman, committee, my apologies for being late. The uh, assumption you need to be under is when you have your regular meeting date, I don't have meeting conflicts. When you move it to a Wednesday, I have meeting conflicts. So that's what's happened tonight. Um, first off, I need to ask the committee, have you received a detailed package from me, either the, that was attached to the official plan amendment or an update. What's your, that's the only thing you have? Okay. You're, uh, you're operating without sufficient information. That's long and short. I'm hamstrung because you haven't had copies of what I have distributed to staff. So, I'm going to have to ask staff to make sure that for the next meeting that all materials that I've provided are submitted and circulated to the committee members so that they can have an equal footing. This is the minutes, the copy of the minutes from the January meeting where you basically indicated you, you didn't want to go ahead without an official plan amendment. And as Marcus has indicated, this is a map that was produced at that meeting showing where there had been a cutback from the previous OP to the current OP in 012. This is more conservative than what planning staff have shown in that if you look at it, I've curved the line down more. It could actually come back over further and perhaps leave more room for an extra lot or two. As I indicated at the January meeting, we were only interested in one lot. This is a site photo of the subject property where the house would be located. If you would look in the foreground, you'll see a major depression. That's roughly an overland drainage area that does have water in it occasionally. Okay. 
This is just an enlargement of the previous uh, document. Following the January meeting, I had discussions with Mark Pomponi. This is one of the key pieces of information that has not been distributed to the committee members. It was formed part of my two packages. Why you don't have it, I don't know. Point of order, Mr. Chair. I'm not sure why you're letting this presentation go forward when he's, he's, he's quoting from a staff member who doesn't work for us anymore. He's told us that we don't have the information in front of us to make a decision, even as slight as to receive it. He's, I don't, know, I don't know why this isn't deferred to some other time when we know what we're doing and what we have in front of us. Why, why are you letting this go forward? If I'm being um, polite to the presenter, to let him present, and when he's finished, I'll open it up to questions. Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a uh, text or an email message I received back from Mark Pomponi prior to his departure from the county. He's indicated that staff inadvertently removed the residential designation from our client's property. And then he goes on to indicate that they won't collect the OPA, the application fee, and he goes on to indicate that when you were updating the intent of the new OP, it was not to remove development rights from the client property. So it's on that basis that I'm here tonight as a technical amendment. I'm not asking for a full-fledged official plan amendment and the related justification. I'm here on a technical basis. This is just a slide that shows how the MDS is met that Mark has alluded to already. And I'm going to indicate this application has similarities to a zoning amendment that was adopted in 013 for, by this council for a property on Blue Lake Road. You can see the subject lot is where my pointer is. It was created by the extension of the SR zoning. It didn't require an official plan amendment. It was an interpretation. That's why I was here back in January. That's why you were presented with that as an option, but you chose not to do an interpretation similar to what was done for me for the lawless property in 013. So with that in mind, that just brings out part of the background reason why we feel that the subject OPA has merit. Now, this is the first page of the material that, as the mayor has indicated, he doesn't have. So I'm just showing you what it looks like. It was three or four pages in length with all the attachments providing justification. You don't have it. There's another one done in May 10th. Again, you don't have it. I made specific reference to the Mark Pomponi um, email in here. I did in the first one as well. Now, summary of the reasons for the approval of the OPA. There were various statements made by the mayor and staff at official plan public meetings prior to the adoption in the new official plan in 012 that were, there would be no reductions in the estate residential. That is what's happened to our client. That's why I'm here tonight. We'd like you to reestablish it. There were statements made by staff at the shoot OMB hearing that I attended with county staff in 013, again, reflecting the same. The email from Tom Pony, I've already made reference to. And likewise, my clients were, in, it was 
indicated that they were advised that after the last severance that they obtained in 06, there was still more potential. So the cutbacks occurred prior to 012. That was unbeknownst to them. They relied on staff indicating that there would be no difficulties. So on to the merits of the current proposal. It's of an infilling nature, complies with the MDS formula, similarities to the love bus, the lot can be serviced, the establishment of the designation in my submission does not offend the purpose and intent of the existing official plan as the amendment would be of a technical nature, meaning the municipality is reestablishing something that was wrongfully, in my opinion, taken away from them. And it technically complies with the PPS and the growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe because it, we're looking at it from a technical standpoint. I have to agree, if it was a full-fledged official plan amendment where it's a new piece of designation, that shouldn't occur. I made statements in January that I wouldn't be up here supporting a new OP amendment. I'm here on a technical basis. So that's the extent of the presentation I'd like to make for you guys tonight. So Mr. Chairman, please to answer any questions if there are any. Any member of the committee with a question of our applicant? Member Miller? Mr. Chair, two uh, questions for Howard because I know we've already seen this before. Howard, uh, what's, uh, what's the land being used for right now? Farming. Pasture. Pardon? Pasture. Okay. What's being used for farming right now? Uh, second question, uh, when you take on these applications, um, in the current OP, it's not designated a rural residential, correct? Correct. So I, I, I'm kind of at a loss in why, why you would be going back to the 2012 OP. Well, it's because of the commitments this municipality made prior to the adoption of 012 that there would be no cutbacks, no loss of anything designated rural residential. And that's the sole basis. Now, one little thought that I have that goes back to 012. This was in private conversations with one or more members of council at that time. There was a, a, a significant concern that if there was any cutbacks, you might have a lawsuit on your hand to go down designation. Okay, I'm just, just to be clear though, we, when you took it on, we, that 20, we were way past 2012. I, I'm pretty sure that's the case. Okay, thanks Howard. Any other member of committee with a question of the applicant? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Is there any member of the audience who'd like to speak to this application? Please come forward, state your name and address. This is uh, Tara Mary Laskowski. We live at, we live at uh, 110 McVeigh. So I've written a letter and I'm sure you all have a copy of it, um, but I just wanted to kind of go over the top three things. Um, so according to the current mapping, our residence is the last residential lot before 120 McVeigh. We did our due, due diligence, we did a lot of research, and we wanted to be the last lot. We didn't want neighbors on both sides. That's why we bought the property. The property isn't a great property, it's got a huge swale, but the fact that we were the last one is very, very appealing to us. Um, second one is the water table on McVeigh Road is very concerning. Our neighbors to the north of our house have a well, but they do need to have water delivered to them by truck as their well runs dry often. And the neighbors to the other side of 120 McVeigh had to have a new well drilled for the same reason. Water is an essential basic need and we should not have to worry about losing our water source. If we lost our water source, this would cause undue financial hardship on us as we would either need to drill a new well with uncertain results or would have to put in a cistern, get water, change our lines to the house. The third thing I just wanted to mention again, farmland. Uh, Ontario is reducing this farmland. We're losing green space, which is very bad for the environment. With clear, clear, sorry, clear, current climate changes, we should all be doing our part to prevent this. Provincial policy does state that agricultural land be protected for ag agricultural uses, as in section 2.3, 
of the, the provincial policy statement, which I'm sure you all are very aware of. Um, and just mentioned to him mentioning about just wanting to sever one lot. They've already severed two lots on our property. Um, they're ours and then the one beside us. So that's three essentially with the potential of two more is what he was saying. So I just wanted to put that out there. And just when we did buy our lot, we did our due diligence and we were told that no other lot can yeah. be built beside us. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other member of the public would like to speak to this application? Please come forward. My name is Debbie Pierce, and I'm from 120 McBay Road. Um, I think the reason why we're having this debate is because we did not take the third lot at the time when it was suggested to us that there were three lots available. If we had done that, this we would not be having this issue. We were assured at the time that we, we had room. Um, and regarding the water supply, you when we drilled your well, there was a plentiful water supply. It, uh, you, had, you had plenty of water. It's well, I'm not, I'm not going to allow debate across the line. Okay. Sorry. First of all, you're the applicant and you should have presented with Mr. Sontag's. Because right now I've opened this up to the public and you're part of the application. And I'm sorry, I'm, I didn't know that. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to allow you to continue because you're part of the applicant and you should have been here with Mr. Sontag. I'm sorry. Thank you. This is a public portion. Any other member of the public would like to speak to this application? I'll ask a second time. Is there any member of the public would like to speak to this application? A third and final time. Is there any member of the public would like to speak to this application? Seeing no one, we'll go back to committee and how this committee wants to deal with this application. Member Colton moves to receive. Member Gatward for seconding. Thank you. Questions, comments? Member Pierce. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm trying to, to clarify something here. Um, Mr. Snodgrass had said the, uh, the official plan was changed in 2012. Is that correct? That's what he said. Okay, so my calculation that's seven years ago, um, one of the delegations from the audience that were up there suggested that they bought the last house knowing it was the last house and it was just suggested that they bought it 12 years ago which puts it prior to the change of the official plan so I'm confused because when they purchased that house there would have been the official plan would have shown that there was other lots there so I'm that piece of information kind of confused me at the end there so I just wanted to clarify that, in fact, it was 2012 that the official plan was changed. Staff will come back with a recommendation on that, either to approve or deny. So that'll get cleared up when the staff recommendation comes back, Member Pierce. Member Coleman? For 2012. Here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could staff come back with clarification on that? Would be better. Yeah. Because that's that would take out the onus of, of who is not whether right or wrong, but where it was set when it was the official plan amendment back in 2012. Exactly. That's what we need, official clarification. Member Ferrier, um, would I be able to ask a question through you to Mr. Trotter? Yes, Mr. Trotter, since you've come up, I have a question for you. The reason I, I want to ask Mr. Trotter specifically okay. is because I saw in the email that was on the slide that you were CC'd on that email, and since Mr. Pomponi is no longer with the county um, and you were CC'd on it, I imagine there may have been some staff discussion you may be in the know. Can you speak to the basis of Mr. Pomponi's opinion uh, about the inadvertentness of the change? Um, point of order, Mr. Chair, we can't no, speak to somebody's opinion no, I'm on gonna, something. I'm going to allow this question because Mr. Trotter was named on an email that Mr. Ferrier saw. Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, I'm not prepared to speak with respect to Mr. Pomponi's advice in this case. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Anyone else with a question or comment? 
Got a mover and a second to receive this as information. Going to put in a request to for a recommendation from SPAC. I know that you're filling in for Dan tonight. Um, would you direct Dan to come back for clarification on the designation at a separate meeting prior to coming back with a recommendation to plan staff? Does that satisfy your request, Member Coleman? Yes. You can handle that? We can handle that, yes, sir. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I'm going to call the vote to receive this as information, bearing in mind we need a clarification before a separate planning meeting for clarification on the designation there under the official plan amendment prior to a recommendation coming forward. Member Bailey? When are we going to get our information? Hopefully at the next planning meeting. Well, wouldn't that, that would be great. Or, or before we vote, it would be nice to know what we're voting on. Yeah, well, we're going to get that before we, we vote. Well, we're going to vote but right now. We're just we're voting to receive his informa the information that was presented tonight. What I can do is I can call a separate planning meeting after a council or a committee meeting to receive that information. I'll call the vote to receive this information this evening. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. We're moving back to public hearings under the Planning Act to approve or deny staff recommendations and we go to number B. That's Jane Perry at 421 Highway number 2 ZBA 15-19-RA and we'll ask Rashika to present. Whenever you're ready. Thank you Mr. Chairman. The subject lands are located at 421 Highway 2 in the former township of Burford. The lands are currently designated uh, agricultural and zoned uh, temporary T37. The proposal is to amend the zoning bylaw to rezone the subject lands to allow for a boarding facility for a maximum of 25 dogs and 15 cats on a permanent basis. Uh, the use was established on the property uh, on a temporary basis in 2016 and no complaints have been received since then. No concerns were raised through the circulation of this application. Staff is of the opinion that the proposal conforms to the policies of provincial policy statement and county of Brant official plan. It is being recommended that the proposed rezoning be approved. That concludes my remarks. Thanks. Thank you. Any member of the committee with a question of our planner? Seeing none. Thank you. Is there the applicant or agent of the applicant here would like to present? State your name and address. I'm Jane Berry. I live at 421 Highway 2 and owner operator of Hometown Kennels. I'm just here to answer any questions if anybody has any. Any member of the committee with a question of the applicant? Seeing none, thank you. Thank you. Any member of the public would like to speak to this application? I'll ask a second time, is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this application? A third and final time, any member of the public would like to speak to this application? Seeing no one, how does the committee wish to deal with this application? Member Bailey? Seeking a second, Member Pierce? Any further comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. This will go forward for council approval uh, 13 days from now. Thank you. Moving on to C, Nathan and Danielle Clarkson, 452 Bishopsgate Road, ZBA 19-19-RA. And Rashika, you also have this one. And proceed when you are ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, similar to the previous application, this application proposes to uh, amend the zoning bylaw to continue the existing dog dog boarding and training facility on uh, 452 Bishopsgate Road. The use was established in 2015 to examine the performance of the applicants and uh, we have received no complaints or concerns from any residents. Um, in addition, no concerns were raised uh, through the circulation of this application to, uh, to staff and agencies. 
staff is of the opinion that the proposal conforms to the policies of provincial policy statement and county of grant official plan. It is being recommended that the proposed rezoning be approved. That concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Any member of the committee with a question of our planner? Member Bell? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I ask you to uh, uh, our planner. On page 169, it's a response from Energy Plus. It's just a matter of, of clarification. It says, request for a zoning bylaw amendment. Yada, yada, yada. Then it says, next line, request to tear down the existing home and replace it with a new home. Uh, just for clarity, I I'm, I'm presume that last line shouldn't be there. To you, Mr. Chairman, that is clearly an error. Yeah, okay, good, thank you. Member Miller? Well, they did tear down the old home, put in a new home, so. Um, just uh, three, Mr. Chair, to Rashika. Um, is the fee the same as the pre for the, is the fee for this one the same as the previous one? Was it reduced by there? To you, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Uh, council approved the amendment to the fee bylaw, and uh, from now onwards, any applications that come forward uh, will pay the fee that was in effect at the time of making the temporary use application. Okay. No, every time I asked was because you, you mentioned an AP, but you didn't mention an HC. So I just want to make sure. Thank you. Any other member of the committee with a question for a planner? Seeing none, is the applicant or an agent of the applicant here would like to speak? Please come forward, state your name and address. Uh, my name is Nathan Clarkson. We are the ones that operate Perfect Sense Canine at 452 Bishopsgate Road. And I guess that's it. <laughs> Any member of the committee with a question of our applicant? Seeing none. Okay. Thank you. Is there any member of the public would like to speak to this application? Last day, second time. Any member of the public would like to speak to this application? Third and final time. Any member of the public would like to speak to this application? Seeing no one, I'll turn it back to the committee. How does the committee wish to deal with it? Member LaFerriere. Seeking a seconder, Member McAlpine. Any further questions or comments from the committee? Seeing none, I'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? This carried. This application will go forward for final approval to the next council meeting, which I believe is in 13 days. Thank you. Moving on to D, Arthur Subdivision at Oakland and Bannister. Yes, 1 19 DN and ZDA 13 19. And you're filling in for Danny. <coughs> Better luck this time. <laughs> Thank you, I think. Uh, Thank you, Chairman, and committee members. Uh, the applicants are proposing a residential plan of subdivision that consists of 22 houses. Um, the applicant is also proposing to rezone the lands uh, from agricultural to suburban residential and suburban residential with a special exception to permit a minimum frontage of 22 and a half meters on lots 8, 9, 18, and 19, where the minimum frontage is 30 meters. Uh, included in the report is a copy of the draft conditions for the plan of subdivision and that was to facilitate the proposed development, and that has been reviewed and accepted by uh, staff and the applicants. So the land holdings are um, 41 hectares in size, 100 acres, uh, bordered by Oakland Road to the north, Mackenzie Creek and Vivian's Pond to the south, uh, existing low density residential dwellings to the east, and agricultural lands to the west. The southern portion of the land holding uh, consists of a natural heritage area, uh, that falls within the regulation rim limits of the Conservation Authority. Uh, the site to be uh, subdivided is approximately 21 acres in size, has 141 meters of frontage on Oakland Road and 20 meters of frontage along uh, Bannister Street. Uh, a portion of the site was previously used for an aggregate extraction uh, operation and has since been used for agricultural purposes, uh, which continue to present day. Uh, the portion of the site proposed for development is outside of the provincially significant wetland and recommended protective buffers. 
Um, so we had an original uh, draft plan, uh, which included an entrance off of Oakland Road. Um, that has since been revised and attached to the package is a revised uh, uh, lot configuration, which is now a cul-de-sac design. Um, so those were, uh, those were, the modifications were made at the behest of staff. Um, with regards to concerns raised from adjacent owners, there were a number of uh, letters attached to the package and there were some common issues raised and I just wanted to address a few of them. Uh, water, uh, the applicants did prepare a hydrogeological assessment for the property which was reviewed by technical staff and no concerns were raised through the, through the review of that document. With regard to separation from, uh, for septic systems, the Ontario Building Code uh, does have minimum setbacks from ex existing wells and these standards will need to be addressed prior to the issuance of any building permits on the site. With regard to the loss of agricultural land, uh, the subject lands while in agricultural production have been designated for residential development since the amalgamation of the townships in 2001 and so they have been designated for residential purposes. With regards to grading and impacts on adjacent properties, an overall grading plan and stormwater management plan has been completed and that will ensure that post-development flows would equal pre-development flows. Uh, with regard to traffic, as noted, uh, the draft plan has been modified uh, to provide for a cul-de-sac design, again, done at the behest, behest of staff as sight lines are, are improved uh, from the original location at the accesses to the east of Oak, on Oakland, uh, on Oakland Street. So Bannister heading east, the sight lines are better uh, than the, the proposed entrance. Uh, with regard to natural habitat, uh, the applicants did prepare an environmental impact study and, and it did conclude that there would be no impacts on the adjacent provincially significant wetland or the inhabitants of it. Uh, with regard to the, uh, impacts on, a, on adjacent agricultural uses, um, with the existing designation, uh, there would be uh, an MDS requirement for any expanding or new livestock operation. Without the construction of this subdivision, um, that, would, that would still happen. You would still need to do that. So as a result, there really, uh, in the opinion of staff, there is no impact on, on adjacent uh, agricultural uses. Um, there have been some concerns raised with regard to a specific draft condition 28D in your package and that requires, uh, or sorry, it would say if required, an easement on lot 9. Uh, would be conveyed to the adjacent neighbor at 171 Oakland, uh, Oakland Road. Uh, the adjacent neighbors uh, would like the if required removed. Um, staff did attend the site uh, yesterday. We had a look at it. We do understand that the property, uh, the, the structure, the existing house is situated four meter or four feet, I guess, from the, the property line. And as such, it would be difficult to access the rear of the property given uh, the location of the proposed uh, or potential fences that could go up. Uh, However, there are other alternatives that could be looked at as, as well, uh, namely a, a potential easement with the adjacent property at 171 or perhaps an easement across the existing uh, agricultural land. So that, that's 171. Uh, this is 173. The house situated at 173 sits on the property line or very close to the property line as well as the accessory structure in the rear. Um, there is perhaps an opportunity for uh, a mutually um, beneficial easement between those two property owners, one for maintenance for 173 as well as access for 171. Or there's also a potential for um, access across perhaps the uh, remnant agricultural land to the west. Um, there is, there are a couple of opportunities there in the opinion of staff. We are of the opinion staff that uh, the proposed applications are consistent with the, the Planning Act, the Provincial Policy Statement, and the County of Brant Official Plan recommending approval subject to the conditions attached and that easement.
Okay, member of the committee with a question of our planner, member Pierce. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, through you to Marcus. So um, just to confirm here, uh, when you talked about the easement, they want the removal of the if, the if required to be required? Through you, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Thank you. Any other member of the committee with a question of our planner? Member Miller? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to uh, Marcus. Uh, in Dan's report, <laughs> Um, talks about stormwater management and it says the proposed development will provide stormwater management that exceeds the municipal requirements through utilization of low impact development infiltration techniques. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, explain how it exceeds. Well, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, for all intents and purposes, by utilizing the low impact design, they avoid utilizing a, a stormwater management pond and, and for all intents and purposes with infiltration and whatnot, the, uh, the post development flows are, are less than the pre development flows, leaving the site because of the, uh, the ditches. And, and I think probably Jason Fleur can explain it a lot better than I can as an engineer. Member Gower. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to the planner. Um, at the beginning of your um, descriptions, Marcus, you stated it was a 100-acre property. And I just want to be clear, the only portion that is being rezoned, and you just put the map up, thank you, is the part in the heavy red line. The remaining acreage that is owned by the applicant is remaining in the agricultural zone, correct? Through you, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. The the only lands that are subject to these applications are the lands within the settlement area. Thank you. Any other member of the committee with a question of our planner? Say none. Say applicant or each and every applicant here would like to present. Please come forward, state your name. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Eric Solislea. I'm a planner with GSP Group, and we're planning consultants for the uh, the owners, the applicant. And with me is Jason Fleury, uh, who's an engineer with Development Engineering. He's the engineer for the uh, the applicant. Um, just a, a couple of points. Uh, we're here to answer any questions that uh, the committee may have. Um, just in terms of the the overall, you know, the as. Uh, Mr. Davidson has said the uh, the modification to the plan of subdivision was at the, the request of uh, the county staff. It makes use of the uh, the Eric Street uh, Road stub that's currently out onto uh, I think it's ba Bannister. Okay, as you can see on the the plan, there's the uh, the modified plan. Um, as part of this too, we did provide an updated traffic impact study. That was one of the concerns raised by some of the neighboring residents. Um, the the peak traffic generated by the 22 lots is about uh, in the order of, I'm just going to make sure I have this right, but it's in the order of around, uh, oops, my apologies. Uh, it's about 20, p uh, 20 trips just in the a.m. peak and 24 p.m. peak. So uh, over the course of an hour, you know, 20 to 24 trips. And the, uh, the, we confirmed that the, all the intersections, uh, based on the background traffic, background growth, and including the traffic from this, uh, the level of service is A or B. Um, so there's no significant impact in terms of traffic. Uh, the one thing to, to note too, I guess with this configuration, uh, having that additional uh, access out on the Eric Street from a pedestrian circulation standpoint, it's, it's preferable. It, it draws people onto the, the, the local roads um, for walking into the, the community proper. And I guess uh, there's the, the notion of the, uh, that condition, um, the potential easement over the, the back of, of Lot 9. Um, I think the, the flexibility in the wording, there, there is other options, you know, that would uh, could address that, so that that's one of the items that that would be up to discussions between the the owner of the the property over at uh, I believe it's 171 or 174 uh, Overland Road and our, our client. There there might be some other options there to alleviate and, and to address the access to the the backyard. So having that requirement, uh, having the flexibility in the language, I think is supportable. 
uh, from that perspective. And just on the, uh, the site-specific zoning bylaw that affects the, the lands in and around the, uh, the two lots um, at the end of the cul-de-sac, as well as the, the pie-shaped plots at the bend in Street A. Yeah, Marcus, thank you. Um, those lots are, like, there's very sufficient uh, lot frontage in terms of that uh, to, to facilitate uh, building landscape area and whatnot, and those lots are over the minimum size requirement uh, required in the suburban residential zone. So I'll uh, speak to the engineering issues. Uh, thanks again, Marcus, for your summary. Uh, I'll start with the stormwater management, just to clarify that issue. Um, the proposal for this subdivision, uh, as Marcus mentioned, we are, are not proposing a stormwater management system. The existing native material is very granular, very uh, good for infiltration. We've actually designed a low impact development system that would uh, contain up to a 100 year storm. Uh, so that's where Marcus was uh, explaining that the pre-development flows, the post-development flows will actually be less than the pre-development flows that currently run off the site. So we've targeted a system to retain more water and infiltrate it into the ground to uh, increase the water balance on the site. Uh, and manage the stormwater in that way. We are containing all of the flows within the existing site. Uh, at our last meeting, um, there were concerns of uh, existing flows flowing beyond the limits of the site to the adjacent neighbors. Uh, I think we explained at that particular meeting that this will be an improvement by cutting off the flows that are coming off these lands or the adjacent lands and infiltrating it directly onto the site. Uh, to elaborate further, I, there was also a, uh, a lot of concerns about the water supply. The, the well supply during the last meeting and the comments received, again, reiterated that. Since the last meeting, we actually, the owner had two residential wells drilled on the site uh, in, the, uh, in the top stratum. They're, 20, they're approximately 20 meters deep, uh, about 100 meters apart, and they also put in two monitoring wells approximately 300 to 350 meters apart to monitor the drawdown. And they did run the standard pump test, which is 20 gallons a minute for three hours consecutively, or uh, continuously, sorry. And the drawdown was extremely minimal uh, during that duration. Um, one was a, a meter and a half of drawdown. One was uh, three quarters of a meter of drawdown. They both recharged after the three hour pump test one in less than one minute, the second in, in less than two minutes. So definitely concluded there's an ample water supply out there based on the, the wells that were drilled, uh, the wells that were drilled, sorry. Any other questions? Any member of the um, committee with questions? Member Pierce? Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, if we could just talk a little bit about, uh, you were talking, we spoke of the, the flow of water and stuff like that and and like are you using permeable pavement like what sort of can you elaborate a little bit on what you're going to be using so the, for the infiltration I can so we we actually had several meetings with county staff the engineering staff to talk about the type of system and uh, the preferred system is actually to match the existing neighborhood so not put in not urbanize it not put curbs uh, so we're gonna have um, a standard road with gravel shoulders and shallow ditches, not deep ditches. Below those shallow ditches, there are stone trenches that are designed to hold up to the 100-year runoff with a sub-drain underneath that's maintainable. So there's, there's a storage system essentially under the ditches in both boulevards. Thank you. Any other member of the committee with a question of our applicant? Member Coleman? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I hate these damn things. <laughs> um, I, I like your idea of your cul-de-sac, but I don't like the idea of you bringing all the construction equipment in through the residential area. Would it be possible to go for uh, entrance permit off Oakland Road to bring in your construction equipment to build everything there in place and then finish off your last lot last. Because I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the destruction 
of, of the, the uh, of the residents and what Nama got and 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 uh, uh, I like the old plan first. <coughs> I can see the cul-de-sac. I can see the better on the sight lines, but I think it would be a less rigorous on on the residents there for having all the construction equipment coming in there all the time. Uh, that's a possibility. I believe it would be in everybody's best interest to have the construction traffic. I believe. I'm not going to speak on behalf of the county, but I'm sure that that is going to be a requirement, certainly for the site grading, site servicing, heavy construction, removal of surplus materials. In terms of holding out a lot, I can't speak on behalf of the owner to that extent, but certainly it would be in everybody's best interest to maintain an access off open road as long as possible. Any other uh, member Goward? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you, yes, I would agree with um, Councillor Coleman's suggestion as the current village streets were just resurfaced about two years ago and the heavy equipment and um, dump trucks, etc., will certainly crack our new pavement. We've already had some issues just with the garbage truck, so I hope that that can work, so thank you. And um, you mentioned that you did a three-hour water pump test? Correct. The sta standard pump test, the duration is 20 gallons per minute for three hours. And it, that's a standard test? That, that is a standard test. Your typical, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm not the hydrogeologist that performed the test, it was done by LDS, but I believe the stand, uh, conventional is about half the rate, 10 gallons per minute for two hours would be the peak residential use, is my understanding. And peak residential use per lot? Per, or per, per lot. 22 lots? Per lot. Per lot. So you have to multiply that by 22. When, when, when the pump test is done, it, it, it is specific to that area. It's not a multiple of how many lots we look at you know, where the test is and how quickly it recharges. And in this case, it recharged in one and two minutes. Based okay. on the I, I understand that, yes. Okay. I mean, we just heard tonight about McVeigh Road and water issues, so. Understood. Thank you. Understood, and that, that's why the, the owner actually went ahead and drilled the residential wells, because for everybody's benefit, again, existing and his proposed development, would not be uh, very marketable if it didn't have water supply, so. Exactly, and so the, um, will they be um, monitoring the existing neighboring wells that, on Bannister that back up to the new subdivision as well as the properties to the west? Will they be monitoring the well levels at some point? It's already, the, the water supply has been confirmed through the hydrogeological study and the pump test that there is adequate supply and adequate recharge. So there is no requirement to monitor existing wells. That, that okay. and, and what would happen if, if an existing well was affected? How would that be dealt with? I can't speak to that because there could be way too many factors. The age of the well, there are so many factors that we couldn't speak to why a well somewhere else wouldn't work. Thank you. Member Bell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to the applicant. Yarrick Street, uh, at least my view from uh, Google Earth, shows it just as a, a piece of grass at the moment. Is that something that you've negotiated to purchase to allow this to happen? Yarrick Street is an existing municipal road allowance. It's just unopened. Just unopened. So it's, just, just it's, it's already county-owned. It was already predetermined to be a road at some point in time. Any other member of the committee with a question or applicant? Seeing none, thank you. Before I open it up to the public, I want to clear with um, Member Coleman on using that lot to enter in for construction. Do you feel that should be added to our conditions? Because there's a number of conditions here. We'll add that at the appropriate time before it comes to a vote. Is that in agreement with you, Member Coleman? Yes. So we'll make a separate motion to add that to the conditions. Can I just add that, obviously well, the wording can be confirmed yes. through yes. the owner. 
Yes. Okay. Now I'll open this up to the public. And is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this application? Yep. Please come forward and state your name, address. My name is Elisha Whale. I live at 6 Bannister Street in Oakland. And uh, that property has been owned by my family for 30 plus years. Um, I have a few concerns. At the last meeting I was here, I'm totally against the whole subdivision, but obviously I'm just gonna pick my battles. Uh, last time I was here, I was asking for no access on Malcolm Street and only to have access from Oakland Road. That was with the old setup. Um, so since then we received the new, new setup that has the two entrances off of Bannister Street now instead of removing one. Um, my concern is for my children's safety, other children's safety. People already come down our road way too fast. Um, Yerrick uh, Street comes out the first access there when coming down the road. It comes out on a hill. Um, so. To me, that's not safe to have people coming out onto Bannister Street on a hill. Um, also, Yerrick and the Malcolm Street entrances uh, to this new cul-de-sac are only 150 meters apart. So it seems a little silly to have two entrances so close together. Um, the Yerrick Street will also disrupt many of the people surrounding. Um, where it comes out, the four homes there, everyone that lives there, uh, I'm not one of those homes, uh, I'm over one, but they have been there 20 plus to 30 plus years, and now traffic will be coming beside their houses, and then coming towards their houses, traffic with lights, etc. they'll probably have to be lighting put in at the corner, where um, if there was only Oakland Road, that would be, again, my first choice, uh, but if I'm now just trying to uh, stop two on my street, Malcolm would be the next best choice because at Malcolm there is the lot as noted on the picture that belongs to the owner uh, so it's not shown as a building lot and there's no actual house there. It's just a piece of property owned <coughs> by the applicant. Um, there's also just a welding shop so a business not again wouldn't have as much effect. Um, it's a smaller business and uh, the house across the way is currently for sale. So anyone purchasing that house would know the, uh, sorry, it's old? Someone say? I thought someone said sold. Anyways, uh, they would know this proposed plan and know what they're getting into, I guess, where these other people have lived there for 30 plus years. But I've grown up there my whole life, looking out my window, seeing a farmer's field. Now there's gonna be 22 homes. And now there's going to be, uh, Again, two accesses on my street. I have a four-year-old, a one-and-a-half-year-old. I'm not the only person with kids there. And like I said, the traffic just goes way too fast already. Um, I've also been told that part of the, the dislike of Oakland Road was because there's no sidewalks that continue out to that area. The last street that was um, built in Oakland was Tyson's Way. Um, I don't know exactly how long ago. I would guess 10 years ago. Someone might know better than I. Um, Tyson's Way has no sidewalks out to it. Tyson's Way is only one access from King Street in Oakland. There's no dual access there to connect it to the town. Um, so I don't know why that couldn't happen here again. Um, back to Bannister Street, the previous meeting, and now they've just said it was low impact for traffic for our street. Currently, there's only approximately 28 cars on our street with the houses that are there. It was putting in 22 new homes that can only get out to the road on Bannister Street. And if you say the average household has two cars, which is how I did the math for Bannister currently, then that's 44 vehicles additional that will be on Bannister Street when prior we only had 28. Um, I think that's my main point. Uh, also, I'm hoping that the money that goes into the county grant will once again go to 
or will go to our park. I mentioned that last time. Our park's lacking in some ways, and uh, I think that the money, because there is no green space in their plan here, that the money needs to come back to Oakland because with all this construction for all these homes, we're the ones that are going to be affected. And uh, with other construction they did with the... Uh, I forget, Enviro being hauled back there constantly and then hauled out again. Uh, there was dirt and debris and et cetera, and my kids couldn't even play in the backyard due to odor sometimes. So my concern for this is that we need somewhere for the children to go. And uh, lastly, my husband had a good point that uh, they did uh, recently dig these uh, four residential wells, and I'm not sure if because it's farmland and these are for residential wells, if that would have been permitted, or if that is against some sort of policy, or etc. So, and I'm hoping that is all. Thank you. Any other member of the public would like to speak to this application? Please come forward, state your name and address. My name is Rachel Siderfleet. I live at 176 Oakland Road. Um, I've lived there for 47 years, so now you know how old I am. Um, I have a couple of concerns with this, more than a couple. Uh, one is water. It's always been very important. We're on a well system. I'm well aware that uh, farmers also draw quite a bit of water. We've had some very dry seasons, very dry. And we've had to conserve water. My family in particular, and I know my neighbors. Um, with the additional draw of 22 homes, especially people who don't understand perhaps a more rural way of life, um, I'm concerned at peak dry times, which is usually August, sometimes July and August, uh, they're going to be out watering their lawns, washing their cars, and having a total disregard for other residents who maybe have a better understanding of the water draw for sweet corn, agriculture, things that uh, have been going on here for quite some time. So my concern, again, is clean, potable water, and who's going to be responsible when my well goes dry with these 22 homes? Okay? So it's, it's probably not going to be the developer. They're going to be long gone. But who is here are you. So is the county going to be responsible when my well goes dry and I have to cart water in so I can drink and wash, do basic things, and not wash my car or water my lawn? Because those things are just, to me, they're frivolous. I gotta drink, I gotta eat, I gotta smell good, because I gotta work too. Um, the other issue that was brought up was traffic. How this will minimally affect traffic on Oakland Road. I can't even walk on Oakland Road anymore. I've lived there for 47 years. I won't let my parents walk on that road. I feel uncomfortable when my nieces and nephews come over and want to go bike to the trail on that road. Um, they speed down that road. We have trucks putting on their Jake brakes right at my house. I'm sure my neighbors can attest to this. And it goes, it, it's well marked a 50 kilometer an hour zone, 80 to 50. They are speeding down that road. And now we're going to have an additional 22 houses with a minimal, let's say, 22 cars, if not more. Uh, perhaps, perhaps it might be taken into consideration to lower the speed from an 80 down to a 60 down that entire stretch of road for safety reasons. And I can well speak to that. Um, My other just question 
is this is I know this is within the settle, settlement boundary here. This this is within the settlement boundary. I know that they obviously own more of that property. Is this going to be developed in the future? And if so, um, how will we know that? Will we get another notification? How does that work? Because if we're going to protect it, these agricultural lands, this is important. Very important, uh, especially for wildlife as well. I know there are bald eagles that actually nest along that stretch of Mackenzie Creek. So, if I, I know uh, the previous person who says I got to pick my battles here, I'm, I'm sure this is going to go through. But I'd like to see it stop there. Uh, we have to protect our agricultural heritage, our wildlife. Our, uh, our water resources, especially. And uh, that's all I have to say. Thanks so much. Any other member of the public would like to speak with this application? Please come forward, state your name and address, sir. Hello, I'm Leonard Lefebvre. I live next door to Yarrick Street. I'm at 8 Bannister. Um, I have to say that when I saw this second rendition of the plan, I was just uh, a little surprised uh, for very the same reasons Alicia brought up at the beginning, which is you're now going to have 44 cars a day go in and out at least twice each, I would think, and all of that is going to now end up on Bannister Street. I, I, I don't understand why we do not go out to the main Oakland Road. I certainly understand from our, our second speaker that that's, that has its issues as well, but, but putting funneling all of that onto Bannister Street um, where we used to have 16 lots and now there'll be an additional 22 and probably 23 with the undeveloped lot there. Um, the minimal traffic is, is, is a shock to me too. I, I think that it's going to increase quite a bit. This is a bit of a silly story but coming, coming from the street light waiting to turn left onto Bannister Street I have been passed with my blinker on waiting to turn into Bannister. Cars have come by me and flown by because they're out of Oakland and they're now on the highway. And it's shocking, but I have to hold on and wait for them to go by because believe it or not, the laws are, I have to make sure I can make a big left-hand turn. So this is already an issue. Um, bringing more cars out on the Oakland Road doesn't help, but bringing all of those cars down Bannister Street, I think is a problem. I have another question that I don't really know if anyone can answer. What is the development plan? Are you going to sell lots off separately to individual builders, or are you going to have a developer come in and put up 22 new homes? Is, can someone answer that question? Uh, I will call the applicant back up to answer questions like that, sir. Thank you. Anyone else in the audience would like to speak to this application? Please come forward. My name is Kelly Geertz and I live at 10 Bannister Street and I just want to reiterate what Mr. Lefebvre said. Um, when you're turning left from Bannister onto Oakland Road, um, it is actually a safety hazard. Most mornings you have to kind of take off at an accelerated speed because cars come over the hill very quickly and are on your back end before you know it. Um, and also coming left onto Bannister Street is the same thing and I also want to point out that is not meeting the road at 90 degrees. You are actually doing more than a 90 degree turn coming left onto Bannister Street. So visibility coming onto Bannister Street is a little bit difficult. And I can actually have tested this because I almost hit Alicia's mother one night because they were walking on the road with darker clothing on. I turned left and by the time I came around my headlights were onto the street. I barely saw them in time. So it is a concern right at that corner. Um, also, I guess I'd like to address the county where they said it's improved sight lines. I would like you to come and turn left off of Bannister Street onto Oakland Road a few times and tell me how good the sight lines are. It is actually very dangerous there, and if we're going to increase the traffic by that much, I would be concerned because also that's where the bus picks up children in the morning. Both homes at the end of the street have small children, 
So we're now putting a lot more congested traffic at a dangerous intersection. Um, don't know where your traffic study, you got 24 homes. One thing you didn't mention was what's the current traffic level? I've never seen any of the uh, survey type equipment that you see across the road that measures the amount of cars coming in and out. So I believe it really should be reviewed from a traffic point of view. Um, you know, this also isn't a very wide street and you're now increasing that much more traffic. Also, these homes will have to have garbage pickup, more vehicles coming in. So additionally, there's just that much more traffic coming down a narrow residential street. And I think these concerns haven't been addressed properly. Thank you. Thank you. Any other member of the public like to speak to this application? Please come forward, state your name and address. Jerry Kempers. Mm -hmm. I live at 18 Cumming Street, Oakland. I take somewhat of an offense that the second person didn't have to introduce himself, Mr. Chairman. Uh, he did not. He was introduced as their engineer. Well, that's not so What's his name? You I asked me my name. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll get that for you. Thank you. There was circulation of this 125 meters away from the site. Is that from the center of the site or the boundary of the site? Can somebody answer that question? We'll answer it at the end. Okay, because I certainly didn't get notification. And I might be just on the boundary line of that 125 meters. What I'm concerned about is as I look at um, Malcolm Street, okay, that's a wide street. It ends up right on a small, narrow street again. Malcolm Street narrow. How are we going to get up that? Because now we're going to get 40, 44 more possibly vehicles coming down, you know, because the majority of people will take Malcolm Street. Uh, that's very narrow. I remember when I did a five-block subdivision, just on Malcolm Street, I had to widen the road. To these, I know these people, it's private property, they probably are not involved in that, but the road maybe becomes half the size of what it is off Malcolm Street. I'm also concerned about water runoff. I'm taking a lot of water since the streets were repaved in Oakland. I'm taking a lot of water from the county road on Cumming Street. I live at a little dead end street. Cumming Street comes down, and Malcolm Street comes down, and I'm right at the bottom. The engineer earlier said that he's not concerned about existing well, but you know, that's their problem. If I run out of water, can I come back to the county? That's a question. And also, if I get more runoff, because it's running across my yard towards Mackenzie Creek, can I come back to the county if I get more runoff because of this proposed subdivision? Thank you. Any other member of the public would like to present this application? I'll ask a second time, is there any member of the public would like to make presentation to this application? I'll ask a third and final time, is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this application? I'm going to ask the applicant to come back up and address some of the questions that have come up. First question, I'd like both of you to provide your names again, please. My name is Eric Solislav from GSP Group. Jason Flurry from Development Engineering. Question about water. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> one of the questions about water, there is a condition, condition number 11 in the staff recommended conditions that, that reads that prior to the final approval of the plan, 
the owner and developer shall submit groundwater tests verifying groundwater supplies both uh, quality and sustainable quantity in accordance with the Ministry of Environment and Conservation and Parks guidelines for potable water to the satisfaction of the County of Brant. So with that, there's there's been some uh, some of the, the tests that have been done uh, in accordance with the MOECP policies and, and guidelines, um, but that would have to be reviewed in more detail to satisfy this condition in terms of the, the water quality and quantity, but we had just received the, the report now and wanted to share that those, those findings, but as a condition of draft approval, those would have to be reviewed by the county. Um, another question we had was a traffic study. How are we going to handle the traffic? And you want to speak to the traffic study that you did in the extra lots and creating, perhaps creating 44 more vehicles that are going to be using that area? Um, Paradigm Transportation Consultants did the, uh, the initial traffic report and then did an update. So what they did is they looked at the, the background traffic, which is the existing traffic along the, the various county roads. I believe they used uh, county traffic counts, but also did a, a projection in terms of growth to 2028. And in addition to that, they used, uh, used the generally accepted uh, methodology for traffic generation for single detached dwellings to address the traffic for the proposed 22 lots and what they do is they look at the peak times you know basically people coming and going from uh, typical work hours and they assess the the level and operation uh, of the intersections um, going out to county roads in terms of that impact and that's that's where they determined that the uh, the operation of the intersections being uh, one of them being Bannister Road and Oakland Road uh, operated at acceptable levels of service. Now with respect to the speed limits along there I think that's more of a, a county question because that's along Oakland Road is a county road so some of the the questions dealing with speed and whatnot I guess I, I defer to your direction to, to your staff. Uh, another question I have is how are the lots <coughs> going to be merchandised? Or is there going to be one builder build all the homes, or are the lots going to be sold separately with individual builders on, on individual lots? Can you answer that? Um, I can't answer that specifically. I think they're, they're looking at, at a number of different options right now, whether they partner with a specific builder or you know, look at certain lots um, being sold to a, a builder or developer or maybe even doing some, some custom homes as well. But it, it's still, I, I guess the, the short answer is uh, I'm not sure and I'm not sure the, uh, the our client knows at this point. I'll attempt to answer the speeding concern. Uh, we have a lot of speeding concerns throughout the municipality. Uh, my suggestion would be on speeding that you bring forward a request to Public Works to look at lowering the speed limit on the existing streets and roads. That's just what has happened in other areas of this of the county of Brent. And then there's another question which Marcus is going to concern, and that is what happens in the future to land beside it and how we're going to circulate that if needed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, again, when you look at the, the county of Brant official plan, these lands are essentially the end of the settlement area of, of the the west side of the village of Oakland. So if um, someone wanted to make an application, they would go through another public process uh, to develop that land to the west any further. This is the extent of the residential development at this time. Um, there was one question just with regard to circulation, and it is circulated to everyone within 120 feet of the property, and that is with the, the entire uh, land holding. So there's a 400 foot circle drawn around the entire property and anyone that touches that circle is, is circulated applications. I'm gonna wait till we get this on the floor and then I'll go to questions from the committee. Um, first of all, Member Coleman, you wanted to add a condition to the existing conditions. Would you like to make a formal wording for it? Construction, how construction occurs. I'll, I'll put a motion on the floor, Mr. Chair, that um, a construction entrance hopefully can be granted off Oakland Road 
for as long as possible for, for the grading of most of the site and whatnot to, uh, and seeking a seconder for that. Are you seconding the member Pierce? Yeah. Now you want to speak, go ahead. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, if I could. Um, I'm not sure if we're able to, uh, again, I guess it's up to the developer, but if we could specify um, lot eight, I think that would be probably. Eight or nine. Well, I was thinking eight because it gets it away from the, the residents there of, of 171 and 173. So, yep. but I, I guess that would be up to the developer, but I, I'm, I'm happy with the motion as it is. But I, I feel that we can add that as a condition. Okay. A condition. Well, I would like, if you're favorable to an amendment of Lot 8, Mr. Coleman. Mm -hmm. So, speaking to the like added Mr. condition, speaking to the added condition, is there any member of the committee who wants to speak to the added condition? Seeing none, got a mover and a seconder to add it to the conditions. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Now, I need a mover to the amended, moved by Coleman, moving both recommendations. And another another amendment. Oh, you've got another one? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I'm never done. All right. Well, let's move it, which you are, and then, and then we'll get it on the floor, and then add that to your other amendment. Seeking a seconder, seconded by Member Pierce. Okay, now add your amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and, and any condition on page 192, 28-D, that the access easement in favor of the property known as concession one part lot, lot five, 171 North Road be provided. That gives them at least the access up to that piece of property, even though there could be further negotiations with them, but at least it's putting in writing as a condition. Seeking a seconder, Member Miller, are you seconding that? Okay, Member Pierce wants to speak to it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I did, uh, just to confirm with the, earlier on when we took off the, if required, does that not satisfy what we're talking about here? Not in writing, be provided. Everyone comfortable with that added amendment? Any further questions on it? We'll call the vote on that. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Mover and a seconder for the for the added amendments as revised. Questions of the way it's revised. Member Leferrier? Pardon? Yeah, yeah, we passed the amendment. Yes, yeah, we did. Yes, you can. Sorry for the clarification needed there. Um, I can't speak to the water issue, and that didn't come up about. It, a, a few people have said something along the lines of, well, you know, when my if if and when my water well runs dry, do I come to the county? Or who do I go to? I'd like some clarification on that, if possible. Um, I know the engineer did say, well, it depends, because somebody could lose their water not because of this development, but because of some other issue. Is there any opportunity to get that clarified just on the public record at this time <coughs> by your staff? Give it a shot. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as Mr. Fleury noted, there are a number of variables that could go into uh, why a well goes dry. So the onus really falls on the person uh, that the well runs dry on to prove how and why it did go dry. So it, it really does become a civil matter. Okay. So, there, but there is an opportunity for somebody to approach that if if that is the case that it is run dry because of this potentially. Um, though not a great process, still a process. The other piece I want to speak on is traffic because I live in, in something similar to this, except it's 95 units and it backs onto uh, Willow Street, which is a far busier street. Um, and I understand the concerns having with the traffic, uh, but I'll tell you, we have the similar cul-de-sac and I'm glad we do because if we didn't, we'd have the through traffic coming through and it'd be a nightmare for all the kids living in this potential development. Um, I have two little kids myself, and we see that all the time. And I'll say as well, even at peak times, the most cars we've seen at either our entrance in our very similar but denser uh, area is three. Three in a lineup waiting to turn. 
Now, when it comes to things that the county can do, I, I really hope that community members do petition Public Works, but also um, they can request of the OPP to put speed spies up to get actual data about uh, how much speeding is happening or isn't happening. Sometimes you'd be surprised either way. Uh, and I know what in Willow Street, we provided a stop sign eventually due to community concern, and that really helped folks turning left on the one exit or the other, um, because before that it was very, very difficult. So I think we do need to, if we do approve this, uh, work with the community to look at some of those options to ease the transition. But again, much denser than this, 95 units, not 23, and a couple of tweaks and it, and it really works. So I will be supporting it. Member Gatworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the speeding on Oakland Road has been an issue and it has been addressed. I did have the speed limit lowered to the settlement boundary um, a couple years ago. However, I do agree with the comment to push it back even further. I, I know that the OPP are aware of the speeding. They've had their signs out there. And I believe when we had our OPP town hall meetings recently, this road was identified as an area that needed to be looked at in um, the future and I believe it was on Mr. Bradley's list in his 11 page report on making our streets safer. So that's a good thing and um, everybody's in a hurry these days but I, I would definitely be happy to bring to Public Works to have more speed limit reduction. In Scotland area, the speed limit is reduced past the Agra Mart. So there's no reason why we can't extend it further in our area. But the problem is the truck in a hurry. And as far as the access for the subdivision, because of Oakland Road being the way it is, I, th I believe it's safer for residents coming in and out of the subdivision to use the Malcolm Street entrance at the very end or the Garrick Street entrance because of the reasons that have been we've heard tonight about Oakland Road being dangerous and I agree with that so the original Garrick subdivision put that stub street in and everyone knew that there was a future subdivision to go in this area. It wasn't quite this plan, and it wasn't this extensive. Those are my comments. Uh, before we go any further, I'm going to need a motion to extend, to extend the meeting past 10. That's moved by Member Pierce. Yeah. Second by Member Ferrier. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. <laughs> We're going to be off on August 4th. Any other further comments or questions before I call the vote? Yes, very quickly, I already spoke, but the other option, the other issue too that I think folks need to be aware of, and we're acutely aware of it in Paris, is that if the engineers and developers are seen to have done their due diligence, they've worked with the county on this, and we don't approve it, they can go to a tribunal or LPAT or whatever it's being called these days, and likely win and put in more units or put it in a different way. I appreciate them working with us on this and explaining things the step of the way, but we could see 50 units in here if we don't approve it and they've done their due diligence. So I just, again, want to bring that dynamic to folks in Oakland because we've seen it in Paris. Uh, look at our golf course. Any other, anyone else with a question or comment? And I'll call the vote. These recommendations as amended. All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. This will go forward to council for final approval at the next council meeting, which is 13 days from now. Moving on to E, which is Green Farms, 299 Oak Hill Drive, PS3. 16-ND and ZBA 35-16-ND and Marcus has a vote. 
Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so we, we have two applications in front of us this evening, uh, one for the plan of subdivision, PS316MD uh, and ZBA3516MD. Um, the, the area is uh, situated on the east side of Greens Road, north of Oak Hill Drive, and it is uh, immediately north of the Ellington Place or the original Oak Hill School uh, subdivision. Um, the applicants are seeking approval for a 24 um, single detached dwelling uh, subdivision, which includes a stormwater management block. And uh, the rezoning proposes to rezone the lands from agricultural and natural heritage to suburban residential and open space. Uh, these applications were, were placed on hold pending the completion of uh, municipal infrastructure, specifically the airport water supply and elevated water storage tank. Uh, as that municipal infrastructure is scheduled to be completed late uh, summer, early fall 2020, the recommendation uh, is to place subject lands in a holding provision until that municipal project is commissioned and the municipal water is available. Um, with regards to the official plan, again, the lands that are subject to this application are designated for suburban residential uh, as well as natural heritage system. Uh, so the original draft plan that was submitted uh, showed a 23 lot subdivision with a stormwater pond um, on the north uh, component, uh, right up there, that's block number 24. The draft plan has been revised um, to um, essentially keep the, 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 the natural water course in its natural form, or as close to the natural form as possible and it does allow for uh, maintenance easements along both sides of, of that stormwater uh, um, facility. The, the actual stormwater pond has been removed as it is a, an LID project as well. So there will be LID related to this as well. Um, with regards to concerns that have been raised, there, were, there have been issues uh, raised from the adjacent landowner to the north off of Kirby Crescent and there was uh, there was an issue with um, a pond that was dug on the agricultural part of this property so the um, the ginseng operation uh, dug out a, a, a pond and it was burned and it was done in the wrong season for all intents and purposes and it led to runoff going uh, to the north um, I have attended the site with the conservation authority and the owner, and um, just a couple of pictures that I can show is is um, this is looking uh, north towards Kirby Crescent. So you can see kind of a, a bare area that has not taken to vegetation, and uh, the GRCA has suggested planting a wetland mix. That area is about two to three hundred square feet in size. And you can see the iron deposits that are kind of sitting uh, in there. So they do have silta siltation uh, uh, in, in there. Um, so the GRCA is, is, is um, working together with the proponent uh, to kind of resolve that, uh, that situation. This is looking at the irrigation pond looking south uh, towards um, the, the proposed green, green farm subdivision. Uh, again, you can kind of see the, the lay of the land and the valley lands. There are no natural springs in the valley lands and it is a very sandy soil. Um, so for all intents and purposes, the water is draining essentially from the springs here, from the pond running to the, to the, to the north towards Kirby Crescent. Um, so from, from staff's perspective, I think there is what we want to do is, is separate the, the issue that was related to the agricultural operation versus the issue with the residential uh, land use. Um, the GRCA has stated they have no objection to the residential development. Um, they have attended the site again with, uh, with the proponent and, and the proponent has shown a willingness to work with the GRCA to resolve any issues related to that. Uh, we've attached uh, a list of draft conditions. The proponents are amenable to those uh, draft conditions. Um, we 
are of the opinion that it is consistent with uh, the provincial policy statements and, and the county's official plan, and we're recommending approval of the rezoning and uh, zoning or, or in the subdivision. And they're here to answer any questions. Okay, member of committee with a question or a planner? Seeing none, is the applicant or an agent of the applicant here would like to present? Please come forward. If you're going to present along with them, please come up as a group. State your name. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council. Name Huey, state your name and address too, please. Jason. Ian McNeil, owner, and I'm Jason Flurry from Development Engineering. Uh, Marcus Davidson did a pretty good outline in terms of, of the engineering services. Uh, there is municipal water that will be available for the, for the site. Again, as we discussed with the Oakland uh, property, we are doing low impact development for stormwater management. Uh, therefore, there is no longer a need to have a stormwater pond. We're going to infiltrate uh, very similar to Oakland into roadside ditches with galleries below the ditches uh, to increase the water balance to the, to the existing soil. There are great native soils there, and that's why we decided to, uh, to proceed in that manner. And uh, they will be serviced by septic systems in terms of the uh, site servicing. A member of committee with a question of the applicant? And the owner of the land is here also. Anyone with questions? Seeing none. Oh, member got one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the waterway that's shown on the plan, um, and there's a road that crosses it. There will be, just for clarification, for anyone in the audience, there will be a culvert or cement box culvert or whatever is required to go under the road to keep any drainage in this area flowing. We received some letters from a couple of people regarding that matter. They want to protect the water, and I understand that. And can you um, explain the easement um, that's, that's on the plan and how we're going to improve the bank? That's correct. So we did model the 250-year storm coming through the property. There will be a, an engineered channel designed to maintain the existing drainage through the site from the entire catchment with a structure underneath the road. We haven't de designed whether it's going to be a bridge or a culvert, most likely a culvert, to, to allow the flows to pass through. So that is correct. And that will maybe be an improvement over what we have now? It, it, it will be an improvement because it's designed into a, a specific corridor and sized accordingly, whereas the, the flow regime would be wider given its current uh, Thank you. State. Any other member of committee with a question of our applicant? Seeing none, I may have to call you back if there's questions from the public. I'll open this portion of the application to members of the public who would like to speak to this application. Please come forward. State your name and address when you arrive, please. I'm Katie Kirby. I live at 53 Kirby Crescent. Um, my concern is that that soil there is very deeply contoured. It all slopes drastically to a natural channel um, that takes the uh, rainwater down into a trout stream that is about, I would guess, 500 yards from the edge of this proposed subdivision. The soil is very, very sandy, and as soon as they change from the hayfield pasture land that was there originally, um, they planted it in corn. That, of course, disturbed the surface. That sandy soil was carried down into that trout creek every time it rained. Two varieties of trout have been identified 
as um, spawning in that trout stream. Um, a rainbow trout and brown trout. Um, trout can't survive in cloudy, silted water. It has to be crystal clear and it has to be cold, which up until two, three years ago when it was changed to a um, cornfield, it was crystal clear, clear. You couldn't stand in that, wall, in that little creek for more than a minute before your bones would ache. Put your, your hand in it. Your bones ache. It's cold. It's crisp. It was crystal clear. Um, secondly, um, also, so the tractors would be going across that area, uh, uh, the combines, and every time it disrupted the soil, the erosion into that, that stream was horrific. To bulldoze a road across and through it, to dig 24 basements into that soft, sandy soil would cause horrific runoff into that trout stream with just one day of rain while the construction activity was going on. I cannot believe that there's not somewhere else that would not be so strongly affected by the construction that we could place those 24 homes rather than that area, which is environmentally sensitive, environmentally fragile, and it is a water source for a trout stream. If nothing else, it's heritage land. It should be designated as a water protection area, not a subdivision. I think that's all that I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other member of the public would like to speak to this application? Please come forward. State your name and address. Good evening. My name is Kristen Sim. I live at 7 Ellington Place. Um, Council, thank you for agreeing to stay on. I have spent my evening here waiting for my chance to speak, and I thank you for being able to stick with it past my bedtime and past your bedtime. So I appreciate that, and I appreciate um, your willingness to listen to all of us tonight. Um, that really does speak to the fact that we live in one of the greatest counties in Canada, in Ontario. And I'm so proud to be a Brant County resident and be able to come again and have the opportunity to speak to this development. I was here a year ago, July 3rd, 2018, uh, and had the opportunity to learn about not just this development, but two other developments that are very, um, very much an impact um, in terms of this community and in, in terms of the area. Uh, a year ago, I had the opportunity, as I said, to speak, and one of the compelling issues I brought to the table was that I came under the pretense a year ago that there was one development to be concerned with. And I learned a year ago, sitting in this meeting, that there was actually three, and that would include the Forest Road, and that would include the other one, which is Willowdale Street, uh, with the Greens Road, which is behind St. Teresa's School. Um, a year ago, when this was presented at Council, for receiving of information, three were presented. And in fact, as I reviewed last, um, last night, again, what we presented a year ago in this meeting, all three were presented as one. And in fact, the first slide on that presentation was a map circling three areas, one, two, three. And as I came to speak a year ago, I started and compelled the council to say, this was a shame that it wasn't shared more transparently with the residents. The 125 meter rule around who gets notified about these developments in this particular situation felt extremely inadequate. And I was blessed again to be here and learn about all those three together. Tonight, we're here and speaking about one only. I've reviewed again uh, what information is available online. I see the other two uh, applications are still in an ongoing state, which to me indicates that we are either segregating them out into individual approvals to sneak them through more efficiently, or there's other compelling reasons that those applications are, are currently not here tonight as well being reviewed. I can't speak to those obviously because I don't have information and I won't be notified of those ones because I don't live in the 125 meter area with those two applications. However, a year ago I did put my name on the form to be informed of all three developments. So I do trust that our policies and procedures will carry through and I will be notified in the way that I was tonight for tonight's meeting. Um, I have a couple of questions of technicality that I'll start with before I go back and kind of reiterate some of my concerns. 
uh, which, will, which will hopefully sound familiar to those of you who were in these chairs last year at this time. Uh, a couple questions of clarity. Um, a year ago when this, um, when this plan was submitted for information receiving, it was noted in the agenda item for this council meeting on July 3rd, 2018, that the lands were uh, zoned agriculture. Tonight's agenda indicates that these lands currently are zoned agriculture as well as heritage. And I'm seeking clarity to understand the difference or why there has been a change. I'm not sure, but why is there a difference? Uh, additionally, I want to speak to another change which was noted from the planner that originally this plan was 23 units and now has increased to 24 units. Uh, and I think uh, I didn't, I don't feel that there was a substantial reason given for why we're increasing the number of homes in this particular development. And what that does speak to and why that's a concern for me is overall when I consider all three of these developments, there's over 100 homes being considered to add traffic to Oak Hill Drive and to Greens Road and to Robinson Road as those being the primary arteries into this community. And so I am compelling and urging us again to consider that we aren't just dealing with one application tonight. Unfortunately, you need to consider there are two other applications in pending status, which will, in, in, in uh, combination, look like a much more significant impact to the community and the neighborhood we have today than one on its own. Uh, back to my uh, questions of clarity. I didn't understand an acronym, an acronym that the planner used, which was I think LID or LIE, I don't know what that means and would like to get clarity on that. Second question for clarity is um, you've made reference to a package that council has received listing out conditions that has not been made available to the public. I would request that tonight that those conditions be read aloud so that we can understand what those conditions are. <clears throat> As I spoke last year, I talked about a number of concerns regarding traffic, regarding safety, regarding animal life and wildlife along Oak Hill Drive, and about the services that are lacking, quite frankly, in this area around uh, Oak Hill Drive and this Oak Hill community that is within the Brant County versus Brantford uh, municipality. Um, the, the concerns have continued the concerns have been continued to escalate in terms of safety. Um, if I contrast what was presented here tonight for this development versus the one prior in Oakland, I didn't hear anything tonight about a traffic study, which was raised as a concern last year at, a council, at this council meeting by me specifically. And it's on YouTube, we can pull it up. Um, I didn't hear anything about consideration, again, jointly in terms of all three developments. I didn't hear anything else talked about in terms of what the council and the county will do to consider the services that are lacking in terms of transportation, uh, bus services, schooling. Last year I spoke about uh, hearing two days prior to school starting whether or not my children would be permitted into St. Teresa's school. They were not. And in fact, that school is overcrowded and we are lacking in services of local uh, local in our in our community. Again, as we pointed out last year, that school is there, and there are a number of children who are of um, who attend that Catholic school, who do walk, and because of the traffic and the speed limits that get violated in that area, it is unsafe to walk to St. Teresa's school. Uh, as a result of that, our neighbors, in fact, drive their children every day to that school because they don't feel it's safe to send their kids to walk you know, essentially 200 meters down the street. There are a number of community residents who, who are out there walking, walking dogs, walking to the parks that are along there, and we, we have no sidewalks. And this becomes a grave safety concern. As I think about these uh, homes, particularly that would front onto uh, Greens Road, that's on a curve. That curve today is already a concern in terms of uh, speed limits, and, and hazards should you encounter oncoming traffic or, or God forbid somebody walking with their dog along that road. Having cars now you know, back out onto Greens Road is a significant concern for safety and I wouldn't dare have my home on, on Greens Road in that regard. Um, as, as stated last year again, two of the major concerns that were raised already prior to, uh, to, to committee review last year 
were the issues of the water tower. I thank you for the clarity of that project and where that stands in terms of progress. Uh, also the drainage issue and natural heritage issue uh, in terms of that protected lands. I think there has been some, some conversation to that tonight, but I, I again reference back to the clarity that I'm seeking around why the change or why the error in terms of the zoning of lands versus tonight's meeting agenda versus year ago meeting agenda. Mm -mm. Miss anything? <laughs> um, again, I think I, what, what I really wish to do is, is compel the, the council to consider um, that we don't just have one application tonight with, and, and to compel you as a council uh, to work with us as the public to ensure that Brand County remains a wonderful place to live. And in this aspect, these three applications, as I consider them holistically, with adding 100 homes, and when we think about, you know, that looks like as potentially as many as 300 residents, 400 residents in that area, we're not ready for that. That is not sufficient in terms of what we have there today to accommodate that number of residents. And I urge you to use your power as a council and us together jointly as a public to make the right choice and do the right thing in this environment. Thank you. Any other member of the public would like to speak to this application? Come forward. State your name and address, please. Sure. I'm Ryan Sim at 7 Ellington Place as well. My wife asked if she forgot anything, but I, I'd seen enough tonight to know that I can't just speak up, so, uh, so I came up here. Um, the two things I would just add to that are, I, I think, you know, when we look at this overall, what we're seeing is sort of, we're building a patchwork village here. Or, or maybe even a small town. When you start to add these one-off developments, um, you take them all in isolation, they just look like, oh, it's a little street with a few houses. But, but really, we're building a village here, and, and it's being patched together. Um, it doesn't appear to have a plan. Is there any commercial development possible? Are we gonna have the services we need? Um, once there's more traffic and we can't get to Brantford um, you know, as easily, or um, as those roads become more dangerous, uh, is anybody thinking about those sidewalks? So kids in these subdivisions can actually walk to the park. We have to cross a busy road. I, I, I hate biking to the park with my kids. It should be a fun thing, but um, it's just too dangerous um, to, to get across Oak Hill. Uh, we're going to add a whole bunch more houses, a bunch more families, a bunch more cars. Um, let, let's think about the big picture here and, and demand of those who want to develop these kinds of lands that they, they contribute to, to making this uh, a, a real development, um, a real home for people to live in, and, and we're not just just turning over quick little developments, um, you know, as if they don't uh, they don't relate to each other. Uh, the other piece I would add to that is um, I, I'm concerned about water runoff onto the properties that are there on Ellington Place, um, just south of, of this subdivision. They were they were built, as far as I know, um, you, you know, to back onto a field, and uh, and so they've been landscaped that way. And, and I'm concerned about if we do add development, um, much as I hear you're trying to manage the runoff, um, you know, I think if we, if we start to develop on land that appears to me to be higher in elevation than Ellington Place, uh, I know where that runoff is gonna go. And the back of our properties, um, you know, we're, we're expecting a cornfield, not expecting uh, paved patios and, uh, and driveways and, uh, and houses with roofs uh, to be adding all this extra runoff. We've had some heavy rains already this year. The water's been pooling back there, at the back of a number of properties. Uh, so so I'd, I'd like to know um, that, that this development has considered, uh, if it does go ahead, where that runoff is going to go. Um, and it's not going to be going into these houses and basements, uh, properties that they'll back onto. Um, I haven't heard anything about that. I heard a bunch of things about the Oakland development. All the angles have been considered. I haven't heard that here. It's back. You added a house. Um, Change the, change the way that the, the, the creek is gonna flow through there. Um, but otherwise, I haven't heard that, that any of the concerns that we brought up here last year and that a number of our neighbors brought up here last year have actually been considered at all by the developer or by the council. Uh, so we would appreciate your consideration of those and uh, some answers to some of those questions. Any other member of the public would like to speak to this application? Please come forward and state your name and address, sir. Um, excuse me. Um, thank you. 
you, Mr. Chairman, Counselor. Um, frankly, I'm quite appalled. Name and address? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> My name is Terry Kirby. I live at 53 Kirby Crescent, which is just north of this site. So it's me that has been complaining about the, uh, the dam construction, but that's another topic. I'm quite appalled because there's a lack of realization that this is one single system. You can't simply detach the upper end of the stream, build houses on it, and expect it not to have an impact on the lower part of that stream. So this dry upper section is crucial to the health of the lower section. You're also talking about a highly urbanized environment where this is happening. I imagine this is happening in Oakland. I only wish I knew more about the Oakland situation. This is happening all over, and by piecemeal, by little nickels and dimes, by this little disaster, by that little accident, you're totally destroying the water that you need to live. You need this stuff to live. You can't live without it. And you're doing this little bit here, and you're saying, well, that's okay. But you're doing it thousands and thousands upon thousands of times. And you're going to ruin this stream if you don't modify this project. There should be no causeway. There should be no causeway across any stream anywhere in southern Ontario. You should never have to cross a stream. There are enough roads in existence to cross every stream in Ontario. You don't need new ones. So that road is wrong right from the start. 50% of the area that now absorbs water will run water off. It's going to be roof houses, the roofs of houses, it's going to be driveways, it's going to be roadways. 50% of that rainwater is now just going to flow nowhere and do nobody any good. I'm desperate to be telling you, you must modify this plan. You must protect that valley, not by a channel that's some man-made little piece of rock burn. It has to be naturalized. It has to have natural species in it. It has to support natural animals, natural wildlife. That's the system. That's the biome. That's what gives you clean water and clean air. If you start messing with that, you have a little open sewer. That's all it is. It's a little open sewer. It's not a creek anymore. It doesn't run off water into that stream like it used to and wash the sand away. I'm appalled. I, I, I don't know how you can possibly consider this without s severe modifications. The roadway should go. The, there should be no enclosed channel. It should be a natural channel. I'm begging you, Marcus, please come out with me and meet on the site on Oak Hill Road or on, on uh, Greens Road and look at the place. There is not a level piece on it. The whole thing is going to be stripped at once, because that's how modern developments take place. All that land is going to be exposed. It's sand. It's going to run. You will not be able to control it. You won't be able to control it anymore than you control the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. You remember chaos theory? It's out of your control. And there is no technical solution for this. You have to stay out of it. If you want clean water, you have to revise this plan, and you have to, as councillors, vote against their approval. Uh, like I said, I'm appalled. Thank you very much for your polite listening. <laughs> Thank you. Any other member of the public would like to speak to this application? I'll ask a second time. Is there any member of the public would like to speak to this application? I'll ask a third and final time. Is there any member of the public who would like to speak to this application? Seeing none, I'm going to ask the applicant to come back up and address some of those concerns as best you can, sir. Well, the, while they're coming up, our planner will answer that question on zoning, why the zoning was changed. Wait a second, our planner is going to answer one of those questions. 
through you, Mr. Chairman, a, a couple of points that I wanted to hit on. Uh, the um, LID is low impact development. I apologize, planners are awful for acronyms. Um, the, the draft conditions were included in the agenda that was online this evening. Uh, it's, it's on page 259, starts on page 259, and it was made public uh, on the county's website. Uh, no, it formed part of the agenda package. It, it, it was part of the, the, the online uh, agenda package. Um, Through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, the draft conditions are pretty comprehensive. Uh, they are, there's 32 draft conditions that have been attached, and it does deal with uh, matters related to water, storm water, uh, um, traffic, uh, all of those those uh, uh, those things. Um, with regard to the circulation that originally went out, I, I unfortunately don't have it with me right now. I, d I can tell you that the, the naturalized channel is the natural heritage area, and it's what used to be an environmental protection zone. Uh, it's now a natural heritage zone, and and that is. Uh, essentially where the, uh, the, the stormwater channel is crossing this property. Um, with regard to the three developments that are, are uh, in this area, I can just note that the other two are really just not as far advanced as, as, these, as this application in terms of uh, resubmissions and technical information that's been provided. So that's why this is here uh, this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mr. Davidson. As uh, Mr. Davidson stated, there are conditions that go through um, the traffic impact with the, there, there is a specific condition tied to this agreement that will deal with collectively contributing to the traffic solution of all the area developments. Uh, in terms of the uh, services, the, the permits for this specific uh, development won't be issued until the, the, the water is available from the water tower. So we're tied, we're tied to the commissioning of the water tower in terms of getting building permits. So that would deal with that one. Um, there, there, was a there is a proposed improvement on the curve of Greens Road. Uh, basically taking, revising the center line. We've provided a fairly significant curve there. The road will be improved. The curve will be widened to deal with the, uh, to improve a smoother curve from the inside of the subdivision, improve the sight lines. There are also conditions that we have to satisfy the sight line requirements from each of the driveways proposed in addition to the entrance to the subdivision. Um, in terms of the channel stability, uh, I probably could have elaborated more in terms of the channel. It is an engineered channel, as we suggested, and the side slopes, we are aware that it is a, a, a sandy condition out there, which is favorable for our low impact development and infiltration. Uh, you are correct that it would tend to erode when there are large storm events. The, the, the finishing of that channel will include uh, turf reinforcement that will hold the native sandy soils in the banks so it can't be eroded when large flows flow through there. Uh, during construction, there will be erosion, sediment control, protection of the bank to make sure that there's no latent sediment that gets pulled into the stream during construction while the soil is exposed for both the site construction and during house construction. Those are standard requ requirements. Again, there are conditions in the, in the development agreement that deal with erosion sediment control plans, protection of the of the channel um, and cover off those issues. Sorry, I'm just trying to go through and make sure I've captured everything here. Did I capture them all or did I miss something? Oh, yeah, so, yeah, so the, there is one additional lot in the plan. That was an opportunity from getting rid of the, the previously proposed dry pond. We picked up additional land by getting rid of the dry pond, so we use that as an opportunity to um, basically add an extra lot. They're, they're 70 meters deep, I believe. They're plenty large for, 
for the area. They're actually larger than the existing lots on Ellington Way. So in terms of fit, they are still larger. We're not, we're not looking to increase the density there or not suit the area. So they, they were done thoughtfully to be consistent with the existing area that's there. The other, you know, one other one I've got is the runoff to Ellington Way. Thank you. So in, very similar to what we talked about in Oakland, um, the same system here. So we talked about the road drainage and the low impact development into the, the ditches. What we didn't talk about here, uh, same as Oakland, is the rear yard infiltration. There are also rear yard swales and infiltration trenches at the back of each lot. Same as Oakland, we are going to be self-containing all of the drainage up to the 100-year event on this particular site so that no runoff goes from this particular development off-site in any direction. Uh, and if there is any existing um, runoff from Ellington Way, you, you may have indicated, I'm not sure on your particular lot, whether the surface drainage you were indicating, whether it was coming onto this existing site. I'm not sure if that's what you were indicating, but if you were, it would be picked up in our rear yard swale. Oh, on the other side of us. Right, so that is all designed into our infiltration systems. So basically anything coming in or anything within our site will be contained in our site. In major flow, it gets treated and it goes to the existing channel and out. Covers everything I have. I want to mention something about that. Uh, why we realigned the waterways to, to help with the county or whatever is that I think it was in 1980 or 77, something like that. They bought the county bought the land off of the green, and there's a registered easement that runs right from that road right down to Kirby Crescent. So the county already has the, the uh, easement through there to me because all it was ever for was they were worried about the overflow from across the road. And it's never really come to fruition yet. They don't put any water in, really. That's what's there. Thank you. That's it. I'll uh, turn this back to committee and how the committee wants to deal with it. Move by. Member LaFerriere, seconded by Member Coleman to get it on the floor. For questions or comments? Go ahead. Just, it's less about the development, it's more about the second part about the rezoning of lands. I'm confused because we haven't had a lot of votes coming at us double barrel, and I, I was hoping that maybe staff or someone can speak to why it's coming to us in this way, where it's both a, a pretty detailed plan and the, the rezoning. And two, if we decide not to rezone it from you know, agriculture and natural heritage to suburban residential open space. When the water tower is built, does this just come right back to us? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I, I, I guess that would be a better question of the developer. If, uh, if it's not dealt with tonight, um, hopefully it would just be tabled until a future date and not lost. Um, and then it would just come back to this committee at that point. Um, it, in order to proceed through this, this avenue until the infrastructure is in place, we, we have suggested a holding uh, provision that, for all intents and purposes, makes them wait until that infrastructure is done. So um, whether that was to happen tonight or a year from now, it, it, it's in fact the same. Member Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Um, Chairman. The um, concerns about the um, Trout Creek um, for you to staff by the, in the draft plan conditions, um, number five speaks to stormwater management, and B says an erosion and silta siltation control plan in accordance with the Graydon Golden Horseshoe Area Conservation Authority's erosion and settlement control guidelines. 
so, and there'll be detailed landscaping, rock grading, and drainage plans. And the DRC also want a permit um, for interference of wetlands and alterations to shorelines and water courses. So this will, these conditions will be overseen by the GRCA and by our grading person at the county to ensure that the silt, the silt fences that have to be erected protect the creek from um, runoff when they're building the subdivision? Through you, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's correct. Uh, the, the GRCA would sign off uh, in the plan would not be registered until the GRCA is satisfied that the siltation and, and all of that is, is satisfied. Thank you, because that, I don't want to see the trout die either, and I think our environment needs to be protected, and I'm happy to see that that's all being considered in the draft plan conditions. Member Miller? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to Marcus or maybe Rob. Um, we didn't do an area study here, correct? No, that's correct. Um, why, uh, I guess why not? Um, or at what point do you say, you know, um, we should do an area study because we have this, as pointed out, we've got three different developments that are coming online. At what point do you say we need an area study? Through you, Mr. Chairman, it would be... Uh, in relation to the policies of the official plan and the sizes of the development did not trigger an area study to be done in this event, in this case. Okay. Right, thank you. Any other member? Member Bell? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you to Marcus. You mentioned that the other two developments are some way behind in terms of development. When do you expect that they would be brought to us and could we not hold this one off until we saw all three together? Um, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, it's a good question as to when they would be coming forward. I, uh, the day that I went out with the GRCA to walk this site, I walked uh, the uh, Willowdale site to look at the, the naturalized steam behind it, and there's still some environmental work that needs to happen with that. Uh, with regard to the Forest Road, we still have not seen a complete resubmission for that one, so it's, it's a fair ways behind. Um, I, I don't know if they would be ready. Um, it depends on when those those technical pieces come in. It's difficult to comment on when they would be coming forward, but uh, I can say there is some substantial work that still needs to be completed. Member Bailey. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm feeling slightly duped here. Um, I don't know whose responsibility it is to tell people things. I guess maybe because I'm new. Um, if these people weren't here tonight, I wouldn't know anything about a three-part survey. And as the mayor, I feel like I, 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 I should have been provided with some information that I didn't have tonight. So I'm a little embarrassed that I don't know about the other two surveys. But that's up to me to know it, I guess. I'm not sure who should have told me, if anyone. Uh, really impressed by Mr. and Mrs. Kirby um, and you people that spoke tonight. Um, there's just so many things that seem wrong about this whole thing. I know the area very well. Um, and I, and I, I feel really embarrassed that we... Uh, that whenever I've seen a person that has a three-part thing or a four-part thing, they always are very proud to introduce their first piece to a, to a completion of a survey or a a project, and I would think three surveys would be a project. So they should be, this should be part one of three. It should have been transparent. I do feel like they were sneaking it by us. Uh, as I said, I don't know whose fault that is. Maybe it's mine. Um, but I, I just don't, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't feel good about everything. And I don't, I don't like your language, Councillor Coleman. I just heard what you called me, and that's not acceptable. You should be sorry. You should be embarrassed to talk like that at the council table. Let's speak to the application, please. Continue, Mr. Bailey. 
you know what, I can't deal with people that I hear call me profan profanity at the table is not acceptable. You might be tired, I don't know, but that's insulting to me and don't cut me off again when I'm speaking. Councillor Coleman, you owe me an apology. Thank you, I'm finished. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, it is unfortunate we have many new members on our planning advisory committee that aren't familiar with this. It has been presented previously to the um, previous council. Um, there's, and Miss, um, the lady who spoke about the three subdivisions, she is, correct, these three subdivisions have been in various stages for some time now. They've all been on hold because of the water issue out there. The water tower is currently in the works to be built. It's going to still take another year before it's ready, and then there's more work after that to do. I think some of the thinking on this, and Marcus can correct me if I'm wrong. Once a developer gets a draft plan approval, then they can move forward with working on those 30 some odd conditions that are in this plan and in the application. And that can take a year or longer to meet those draft plan conditions. If the approval doesn't go forward tonight, that leaves the developer in limbo and he's not going to go forward with the draft plan conditions because why would he spend hundreds of thousands of dollars more on more studies when he doesn't even know if he's going to get draft plan approval. So that's why the process is set out as it is, and the new councillors are aware. I know that Councillor Coleman and I and some of the previous councillors were aware. Um, so it's unfortunate, and um, they're small subdivisions. And my, by my numbers, when I totaled up the three, it was something like 83 lots for the three of them. So that's all I have to say, and Marcus can correct me if I'm wrong about the draft plan. Or, or Mr. Trotter. Any other member of the committee with a question before I turn to Mr. Trotter, who's got some comments on this application? Seeing none, Mr. Trotter. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Not to uh, belabor this discussion because it's getting late, um, but I just wanted to give some context to Council um, the three applications that are being discussed here um, are separate individual applications by different applicants under the Planning Act. They are not this applicant with two other applications. They are separate individual applications. This one is being brought here this evening because it is ready to go. Uh, they have met all of the requirements. They have met all of the, uh, they're prepared to enter, enter into agreements with us. Um, the other two applications are not there yet, therefore it's not reasonable to bring them before this committee for consideration. Um, all three of the applications are currently in a position where they could be appealed to LPAD for, for a non-decision by this council because the applications were submitted many, many months if not years ago. We were able to work with them to delay the applications because they were aware that only bringing them forward would result in holding provisions anyway because the water tower wasn't available. So we, we, did, we did work with the developers to do that. Um, but I just wanted to be uh, clear to this council that each application is different, each application is separate, and has to be dealt with independently. Thank you. Member Coleman, you have a question? Not now. Mr. Trotter answered all of them. That's what I was going to say. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Seeing none, we need a mover and a seconder to get this got up. Half an hour, thank you. It's been moved and seconded. Yes. Well, we're getting close, Mark. 
All in favor? Opposed? It is carried. This final approval will go forward to council on the fourth, fourth Tuesday of July. Moving on to F, that was deferred. Moving to section nine, consent items. Consent items to be approved, there are none. Consent items to be received, there are two. There is an addition on the addendum. Moving to receive, thank you. Seeking a seconder, seconded by Member Bell to receive. Any questions on either of those? Seeing none, I'll call the vote to receive. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Over the page, the committee reports are none listed. There are no staff reports listed or communications. Anyone have any other business that this is no one indicated? Member Chambers? Just very quickly, Mr. Chairman, uh, we, we do need to look re at a revised uh, set of procedures with uh, the, the changes in the, uh, the Planning Act with regard to meeting for recommendations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm hoping that a report can come on how we do things at our next meeting so that uh, if, if we're going to have uh, applications where we are deemed to be receiving them and we are voting not to receive them, that creates a whole bunch of issues. So uh, I think we need to uh, have a report on our procedure and uh, where we're going from here. Yes, I know you requested that a while back when we went into that chapter break system. Um, General Manager's update. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, d I wasn't going to uh, provide you with an update. However, with Councillor Chambers' comment there, I think what I can state is that the regulations pertaining to the Bill 108 changes have not even been come out yet. So. To, to come back within a month with a with a report is, is premature at this time. So when we can, we will do that. Anyone with any questions for our director? Member Cohen? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's been said before and it's been said here tonight. The residents don't seem to know when there's been an application for it or something. They, they look at the 125 feet or whatever it is. I, Councillor Miller, myself, have asked for bigger signage. We still got them little 10 by 12s or whatever, and I thought we were coming forward with something, and, and I just haven't seen it at, at these sites where there's an application for it, whether it's a severance. You look at some of the ones that are in other municipalities, I can read them from the road going down the road. but. Somehow we need to get this so that the public understands that you just don't have to be within that 125 feet or meters, whatever it is. Anybody can make an objection or approval or, or voice their opinion on a, uh, an application. So. Mr. Carter's coming up with more. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, um, it's 120 meters, just so everybody knows. Um, the, uh, uh, there has been a planning act sign drafted. Um, I know that it was drafted by the previous general manager. Um, however, I will get that finalized and get it to this committee for their review. Anything else? Seeing nothing. 